and welcome to our Today All Day Mind Matters special. You know, this month we're celebrating mental health awareness, a very important topic for everyone, but especially young people here in America. The youth mental health crisis is all too real. So we want to celebrate the people helping to fight it and normalize those conversations. Good example, musician M. Byhold. You may have heard her song, Numb Little Bug. It's her debut single. It's everywhere. It's about M's experience with antidepressants. The earworms blow up TikTok, prompting fans to share their own mental health stories. Last year I had a song called Groundhog Day that was doing well on TikTok and all of a sudden like labels were reaching out and my dreams were coming true very quickly but at the same time I had started on antidepressants and I didn't realize that they could take the highs away as well as the lows and um, I had a conversation with my mom where I was like my dreams are coming true why am I not as happy as I expect to be and she was saying that sounds a little bit ungrateful and I was saying it's not ungrateful let me find the words for you and then basically wrote Numb Little Bug. The viral TikTok launched singer-songwriter M. Byhold into stardom. Like your body's in the room, but you're not really there. Like you have empathy inside, but you don't really care. Like you're fresh out of love, but it's been in the air. I'm a past repair. In February, the single captured number one on Spotify's global viral 50 chart. And in April, Numb Little Bug landed M at the top of Billboard's Emerging Artist Chart. Today, the song has been streamed nearly 250 million times. Do you remember the first time a fan came up to you and said, Em, I heard your song, Numb Little Bug, and it affected me in, what did they say? During the tour, um, I had a few people come up to me and tell me that like they had tried to commit suicide last year and had, you know, kind of recovered and, and found help, but also found my music. and. That's the most meaningful thing I can get out of any of it. The fact that they like felt they had support through what I was writing. And those are probably honestly my favorite moments from tour. And I'm obviously, I'm so happy that they're still here and getting help. What is your history with mental health? Is there any from your childhood or when you look back on your, your young life, do things come to mind? Um, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety, but I also feel like a lot of people in this generation have it. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Anxiety right. society, sister. We're, we're part of it. Me too. <laughs> yes, sir. But it was getting to a point uh, during the pandemic where I was like, I had a mood tracker app and I had so many lows every day that I was like, I need to do something about this. And I had an appointment with a psychiatrist and within 15 minutes she prescribed the meds and I, I was kind of taken aback that it, you know, didn't take a longer conversation to, to do something as drastic as that, but I was willing to try. Did you think about other alternative ways to kind of deal with this as far as maybe going to therapy or whatnot? Um, I've talked to a few therapists and, and still haven't found the right person for me yet, but it is an active search. And I mean, I tried different versions of the medication and just decided that wasn't the route for me. But again, for some people it really is. It, I think it's just finding what's best for you and also making sure you talk to the people around you as well. And what role has music played in your mental health journey? Music has always been my form of therapy. It's just, it's the way that I process my emotions best. It's a flow state when I'm writing and there's nothing quite like it. I have it on good authority that at your concert last night, you actually have another song that's unreleased called One, Two, Three, Four, Five that also deals with the nature of mental health. Tell me about it. Yeah, um, I wrote One, Two, Three, Four, Five with a couple of friends of mine about panic attacks and using the, the counting to five method uh, to get over them because I've had my own experience not to the worst extent of panic attacks but you know where you, you get like choked up and you can't breathe and the whole world yeah. kind of caves in on you a little bit and no well I I have this phrase that's like dance through your depression like I I think we need to sort of band together and find positive ways to describe these really tough things that are going on my generation has a history of and, and others of not discussing these issues. So we, we hide that. That's where that suffering and silence idea comes from, and the stigma on mental health. I mean, I love your bravery in, in the writing of the song and the recording of your personal feelings, how you do it with such courage and you're so unabashed about it. And look, that's so relatable. Do you feel like your generation has a better time of discussing the topics of mental health? Oh, for sure. I mean, I remember I was making a video and I had a pill bottle in it and my parents were like, are you sure you want to show the pill bottle in this video? Because that's a sign of weakness. I mean, that's just what their generation grew up on and that makes sure. sense. But I was like, we just talk about it and we laugh about it because that's the only way 
to get through, I mean, in, in my mind, so I have no shame <laughs> attached. Well, I love it. What did your family say about Numb Little Bug when they heard it, the whole thing? I think the first time they were like, wow, you're really, you're really saying all that. And I was like, yeah. Um, but I think as they've seen the response and the comments and the DMs and the people saying like, you know, after hearing this, I went to therapy or I talked to my family, I think they get it now. Like a numb little bug that's got to survive, that's got to survive. Access to mental health resources is another major hurdle for black and brown communities. And even just talking about the topic can still feel very taboo. So I spoke to one inspiring teacher in Los Angeles about the creative ways that he's bringing those desperately needed resources to his own community and students. Take a look. Whenever you decide to go to therapy, whatever you do, you want to know the questions to ask to find the right therapist for you. But a lot of times we don't know the questions to ask. It's the same thing finding your favorite restaurant, finding a pair of shoes that fit, you gotta try a few on. For BJ Williams, mental health is a calling. So BJ, your friends and family know you as the mental health guy, huh? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the mental health dude. <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, man, you know what? I actually started when I started going to therapy for myself, and then I started doing this work that I'm doing now, and so yeah, that gave me the moniker of the mental health guy. My initial uh, intro into therapy was actual couples therapy with a girlfriend. In, in, during that time, my older brother died by suicide. And I left that relationship and a week later got into individual therapy. Your, your friends, like what did your friends think about you going to therapy? Did you tell them? Yeah, it was great. They were very supportive. And then I found out that some of them had gone before as kids or as teens. They just never spoke right. about it. And here I am, I'm like, yo, man, I gotta go to therapy today. And all of a sudden it was, yeah, B, I went to therapy before. And I was like, well, why, how come you didn't say anything to us about it? So it kind of just opened up the, the, the conversation within, within my network. Why do you think that? Why do you think people aren't forthcoming about going to therapy? There's a stigma behind it, specifically, uh, especially, not specifically, especially in, in black and brown communities, especially amongst men. And so it's one of those things that, that are, you know, stigmatized and that we're afraid to say because, like, it's either you're crazy, you're on pills, or we write it off. But instead of writing it off, BJ kept the conversation going. As a teacher at Jefferson High School in South Central Los Angeles, he saw his students struggling with their mental health. There's nobody on this planet that doesn't have some form of struggle, right? But I'm in the underserved, you know, what would be considered uh, poverty level community at a, at a high school that's one of the oldest high schools in LA. Um, and I know this, that the makeup of the, uh, of the school is mainly Hispanic Latina. We lack uh, resources here, you know, we lack school materials here. We lack a bunch of things. So he launched the Can I Be Vulnerable bus in March. Its first stop, Jefferson High School. So we provide the community with questions to go on the bus and interview a mental health professional. So that way, when they're ready to embark on their own journey, they at least have some knowledge on what questions to ask. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, black Americans are 20% more likely to experience mental health issues, but are less likely to receive mental health help. And more than half of Hispanic young adults with serious mental illness may not receive treatment. There is still that family stigma that the kids themselves probably recognize that their parents or their guardians probably are still on the, the, the stigma of you can't be crazy, we can't afford to be crazy, that's for white people, we, you know what I mean, like we don't have access, that kind of thing. I'm reading your shirt, but tell me about that. Can I be vulnerable? What's the, what's the history with that? Can I be vulnerable is my mental health platform. Uh, it started off as a uh, docu-series, actually. Um, I recorded about 50 plus black men, and I let just them just talk about their mental and emotional health journey with a very personal story. Can I be vulnerable? Yes, you can. Will you be vulnerable? Well, you should. Um, we did that for like a year and a half, and then it kind of evolved into some other things. Um, created a curriculum for high school students. What does "Can I Be Vulnerable" mean to you? <laughs> Funny. Uh, it's 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 a question, and it's also a statement. So for me now, when I say "Can I Be Vulnerable," I'm probably going to say something real. Like I'm I'm going to get emotional with you. I'm going to tell you something. I want to share me with you. So when I say "Can I Be Vulnerable," that means listen up, because I'm about to we're about to get into a conversation. Something that I need to hear, or I want I want you to know about me. How did the bus come about? I was thinking how to further do the work. And I was like, I don't, why don't you just taco truck this thing? Why don't you just bring the people? It was a very simple concept. How about I put mental health professionals on a bus and take them to the community like the ice cream man? And that's basically where it started. <laughs> I, it was nothing profound other than that. Right. 
I'm thinking of Eddie Murphy. Mom, throw down some money. <laughs> the ice cream man. Uh, yeah, here. like it was really just that. I was like, you know what? Mental treats for the for the kids, man. I think it's brilliant. That's really what it was. I was like, yeah, if I had a theme song, they know it's gonna be mental health coming. When you were done with your event at Jefferson, did you hear back specifically from any students? What did they tell you? They liked it. One, <laughs> they felt it was needed. Two. They would definitely go on a bus again, but more specifically, they do plan on going on a mental health journey. Um, having somebody that looks like them was really encouraging. They felt more at ease. There's an important part here about cultural competent care, right? I mean, that's at the essence of this. Yes, yes. And depending on what community we go to, I'll reach out to the mental health resources in that community so that they can do the work. I just have two office spaces on a bus. Um, but essentially, it could be resourcing where these social workers provide resources to the community on where they can act, get access to care, either free or you know sliding scale, or provide something themselves. On the other end, it's uh, it's educational as well. Now, I didn't expect the kids to get on board to and just open up, but we also had you know mental health professionals that looked like them. I had a black man, I had a black woman, I had a Hispanic woman. They spoke the language, and I think that helped tremendously. Hey, do you think that the, like this this particular generation of young people that that you work with? and talk to and know, do you think this is the generation that can really help destigmatize the mental health issue in the black community? I truly believe that the next generation looking at us do this work and will continue on and will definitely do it. Since its launch, BJ's mental wellness bus has made more stops around Southern California and Las Vegas. BJ plans on keeping those conversations and his bus rolling. And that's the thing about it, if you build it, they will get there eventually. Cause I, I've been noticing like, again, with my bus, people have been asking me, B, when are you coming here? When are you coming here? This is great. But I do think the future of it is bright. I, I do think this can be something that can go worldwide, honestly. That is a stud right there. That's BJ Williams. He's got big plans for that bus and that community. We appreciate his time and efforts out in California. Coming up next, we're gonna check back in with Ohio State's Harry Miller. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Jackson now weekdays at five on NBC News now welcome back to our mind matters mental health special today we're focusing on the people who are pushing the conversation forward on young people and mental health on the surface college football player Harry Miller seemed to have it all but the offensive lineman struggled with his mental health behind the scenes opening up about his football retirement on the Today Show in March sadly he's not alone in his mental health struggles we caught up with Harry to talk about how he's doing and what needs to happen now when it comes to athletes and mental health I don't think it can just be college football because there's been so many other athletes from different sports who have shared the same thoughts. So it's all within college athletics. In recent months, a series of high profile athletes across the US dying by suicide, raising questions about what can be done to better help student athletes manage their mental health. I wish I had the foresight to diagnose what was going on. I think the worst part is when we don't talk about it.
I've been in the sphere of seeing psychiatrists or mental health professionals since I was young, since I was eight years old or so. Um, but prior to the season last year, I was in I was in a pretty poor spot, and perhaps poor is an understatement. Harry's been on the football path since he was little. While it started off as just an after-school activity, he later found himself struggling under the pressure. I remember a coach one time during recruiting when I was a junior came up to me and talked about the NFL. I remember like in that moment, um, I don't know, you just feel sort of the, the weight of the hand you've been dealt. Some of those prophecies feel like death sentences. And you're like, there's no way out of this. Everybody thinks this is what I am and I've got nowhere to go now. Last season, he hit his breaking point. So I, I spoke with my coach, Coach Day, our head coach at Ohio State, and um, was just honest and straightforward with him. I was depressed and anxious and I had suicidal thoughts and um, over the course of what was the season essentially, I was, I was receiving help for that. And I think back about how could I have been so sad and have felt so awful that I, that I would have wished not to be here. So he retired from football. Harry, in March, when you said that you're going to not play football for medical reasons and you got the courage and you actually did it, what did that feel like? Yeah, it felt awesome because um, it felt like taking a mask off. And prior to that, having to wear a mask, I gave up the stuff that was not for me to begin with. And because yeah. of that, I'm just extremely, I'm extremely grateful. And it's honest and it feels, and it feels great. When you were on the Today Show and you shared your story, what was it like when you like got off TV, like what was the reaction to that? It was huge, a huge response. I had high schoolers talking about their experience. I had other college athletes talking about their experience. I had middle-aged men talking about how they wanted to take their own lives. I, I don't know, I don't know many issues um, that spread across every demographic like mental health does. Yeah. And it's our hearts, it's our souls, and it's in every single one of us. What does your mental health like toolkit look like? What works for you? Do you go to treatment? What do you do? I would say I have some some like logical backstops in my head now. I just think of all the people who love me. I think of my mother and my father, my brother, my girlfriend and my friends. For me, it feels like I, I sort of hiked forward a few miles and got the layout of the land and I'm hoping to just come back and say, like, you don't have to keep going this way. There's a better route than this. At Ohio State, Harry still trains with his teammates each morning, and the football staff has begun a suicide prevention training, which will equip them with the tools necessary for responding appropriately to someone in crisis. QPR, question, persuade, refer. It's a way to save lives. It's a way to give people hope. With the pressure of playing collegiate football lifted from his shoulders, Harry is focusing on his education. Someday, he wants to be a Rhodes Scholar. And he's enjoying his hobbies, from reading classic works of literature to playing guitar. If I'm sad, there's a sad song to play. And if I'm happy, there's a happy song to play. And um, I don't have to put it into words. And it's, it's, it's already there. For anybody who stumbles upon this and, um, and watches it and is struggling with their own demons, what do you say to somebody like that? There is nothing so absolute as as suicide and i remember i was talking to my friend um when i was in a bad a bad way and um he just said give it another day and um that became a sort of motto of ours to just give it another day what a great guy and such an inspiration Appreciate Harry. Coming up next on Mind Matters, we're going to show you two different apps trying to help teens' mental health. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. So today on Mind Matters, we're shining a light on the people working to solve the youth mental health crisis and eliminate the stigma around discussing the topic. Now, part of that battle includes, of course, meeting young people where they are, where they frequently are. And where's that? Yeah, their phones. So we wanted to highlight two apps that are helping out. Every teen should have Teen Talk. After school, 16-year-old Lana Garrido logs into Teen Talk and gets to work. It's kind of an outreach app where, like, teens can use it as like a resource whenever like they're in a crisis or like they need someone to talk to. On the app, teens can anonymously post about what's bothering them, whether it's mental health or relationship problems or issues with friends. From there, Lana and hundreds of other teens work as teen advisors, trained to respond empathetically and offer resources and coping techniques peer to peer. Teen advisors receive 50 hours of training and are supported by licensed mental health professionals who can step in if a user is in crisis. 17-year-old Serena Guerrero has been a Teen Talk advisor since 2020. There's a shared understanding of what high school is like. There's a shared understanding of how friend groups can be. And that's something that I don't think that you can always get from an adult, no matter how much you trust them. The app is offered through the Jewish Big Brothers Big Sisters of Los Angeles organization. Teen Talk app was started four years ago in response to a growing need that we saw for teens to receive mental health support. And to date, we've reached over 40,000 teens in the last four years. At the start of the pandemic, the surging number of new users crashed the app, which had to be rebuilt to accommodate its new user base. We've also seen that for a lot of teens, just having a conversation with a peer about what they're going going through can be a protective factor that allows them not to go down a path of more mental health challenges, more anxiety, more depression, that it actually prevents that. And that mental health support and validation can go both ways. What made me want to join Teen Talk was it was a personal experience. Um, I struggled with an eating disorder myself. And I feel like through my journey with mental health, I kind of wanted to be that person I wish I had when I was struggling. I feel like I was able to relate with other kind of teens who are going through like similar things. Sometimes it's not even about eating disorders. It could be something about like body dysmorphia or like kind of body related issues. And I feel like that definitely kind of helped me heal from that experience. So one of the lessons that we go over in training and in our continued education classes are dealing with people who struggle to come out as part of the LGBTQ community. The way Teen Talk was just able to make that feel so normal, it really empowered me to come out to um, friends and family. Um, and I, 
I didn't know at the time how much hiding that part of hiding that part of myself um, was affecting me until I was able to come out. The app wants to break multiple stigmas around getting mental health help and show that sometimes being on your phone is a good thing. The reality is that teens have a smartphone, they're on their phone, and they're on social media. And we want to make sure that Teen Talk app is what they're accessing because it's safe and it's really a good resource for them. Social media does have a bad reputation and I see it on our app. I see teens coming to us about being very insecure about the way they look because they see all these photoshopped models on Instagram, TikTok. However, Teen Talk, you don't see anyone. There's no talk about what makeup brands to use. On the app, you come on and you see other teens posting about things that they're struggling with. That urge to strip away all the gloss and Photoshop on our feeds, powering another app called Be Real. Once a day, at a random time, users get a notification that simply says, time to be real. At that moment, you've got two minutes to snap a pic. Your phone's front camera captures what you're doing, no matter how mundane while the rear-facing camera captures a selfie of you. It's really like just a snippet in someone's life. It's just a snapshot. Maybe I just got out of the shower or like I'm in the middle of working out or something. You know, nobody's photo is going to be of them in like full glam, you know, like looking their best. You, I think it's sort of an unspoken rule that we're all going to do it and be, you know, our just like natural selves. Even though the app launched in early 2020, it really skyrocketed this year growing 315% since January 1st, according to Aptopia. For college sophomore Juliana Cofferella, she says it's a way to share a more real part of her life with close friends, like when she got a notification during her aunt's funeral. So I like quickly snapped just like a picture of like just my eyes up um, and they were like really puffy from crying at a funeral. But you know, those are things at like slightly more vulnerable moments. Be Real is marketed as an alternative to addictive social networks. It won't make you famous, the company bluntly states. If you want to become an influencer, you can stay on TikTok and Instagram. It's definitely not as draining on your mental health. You know, it's not these like curated images from celebrities or influencers or anything. Like it's really just your friends um, that, you know, you're not getting that sort of outside pressure to be something that you're not. Two apps trying to foster better mental health for teens. Hopefully both of those great apps will inspire more just like them. That's going to do it for our Mind Matters special. We certainly hope that these stories inspire you to please keep the conversation going with your loved ones. To find trusted mental health resources, that's a hard thing to do. If you're looking for those resources near you, we encourage you to visit Project Healthy Minds. I'm on the board. They're doing some great work, and they can help you hook up with those resources. You can find more information at today.com slash mindmatters. We appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Can you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
You know, I love me some country music. And high up on my list of favorites, Thomas Rhett, baby. You know, I've listened to that Die a Happy Man song probably about a gazillion times. Okay, Thomas was born with a passion for music at his very core. He and his dad, country singer Rhett Aikens, have worked on music together since Thomas was just a little boy. His love of music has carried him all the way to where he is right now. Thomas, his wife Lauren, and I have been friendly for years, but recently we've connected on more than just music. We're also parents by way of adoption. Thomas and Lauren brought their beautiful daughter, Willa Gray, home nearly seven years ago. And they've gone on to welcome three more daughters to their family, Ada James, Len and Love, and Lily Carolina. Between recording, touring, and parenting, it's kind of tough for Thomas to make space for much else. But I did catch up with him for a rare moment of quiet from his home in Nashville, just as he's getting ready to release his sixth studio album, Where We Started. And among the many topics we touched on, where he started. Stories that make me appreciate Thomas and his music even more. All right. Well, first of all, uh, Thomas, it's great to see you. As always, how are you? Good to see you, too. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, Thomas, I, I feel like you're, you're really going 100 miles an hour. And I admire it because we often say, this is my moment. I got to catch it. It's like lightning in a bottle. I don't want to miss it. But if you were to have a day that was just for you, again, Lauren and the kids aside, you have an open book, a, a blank slate for one day. Yeah. How does that day play out for you? Um, <clears throat> I think I would first of all have to get on a plane. Uh, I have a hard time finding peace in Nashville, but I've I've found a lot of peace and solitude out west, whether it's in Montana or Utah or Colorado. And I think a perfect day for me would be to take my fly fishing rod out mm. to the Boulder River in Montana and just wait it the entire day. Just like start oh. at the bottom, go to the top. Uh, don't even care if I catch a fish or not. Just the the simple act of throwing a rod in and out of the river, I think like that that is the epitome of my uh, perfect alone day, which I have not had an alone day, I think, in almost five years. So yeah, at least I, I, I need to schedule say. that. So what is it that you get out of being by yourself and throwing that rod? Like what feelings yeah. do you get from that? Uh, there's no one to compare myself to except for myself. Um, mm -hmm. Like – I think as awesome as social media can be, uh, I think I think it ruins a lot of people, uh, and I'm I'm in that box. And I think, I mean, shoot, I guess I've had social media for almost ten years now, and I feel like every time I log on to my Instagram account, I get this like really quick little rush of like, oh my goodness, what did someone say about my song, or what did they say about this? But then I see one negative thing, and like my day is just like ruined. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so when it, when I do like get to put my phone down for five or six hours, I find my anxiety level just going Dropping. down and down and down and down. Now I do have four kids. So the anxiety does stay at a, at a little <laughs> right here. Um, yeah. But I just feel like the more that I can detach from the overload of information, you know what I mean? Like I, I just don't feel like we as humans were built to absorb and, and you absorb more knowledge than anybody that I know every day. And, like, I just don't know that we were meant to know as much as we know. I think when I when I am away from anything social or news-wise, yeah. yeah. like, yeah. I am a better dad. I am a better husband. I'm a better friend because there is space to give yes. that part of myself. When were you your happiest? I think I was, in a strange way, happier at my core when I felt like I wasn't under a microscope, if huh. that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, I know you I know you can relate to that, mm -hmm. but like, would I change anything that I have for the world? No. Um, mm -mm. But there are days where you, you do kind of wish you could just be just you at the core, no matter what, no matter what restaurant you're in, no matter if you're at Disney World, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's that, that has changed a lot. I mean, I, I have learned how to find joy uh, a ton, mm -hmm. like through, through quote unquote being famous or being under the spotlight, but mm -hmm. there just seemed to be something so simple. I don't know mm -hmm. about being in high school or yeah. being, in, being in college. Yes. Um, um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's something that Lauren and I both try to create in our lives is simplicity mm -hmm. and, and normalcy. You know, a lot of people always ask how are we raising our kids and we're trying to raise them as normal as humanly possible, which is really challenging because our lives are anything but normal. 
you know. Mm-hmm. But I think striving for simplicity has brought Lauren and I and our kids the most joy that, that we mm. could imagine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Can you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. From the moment I met you, whenever that was, a long, long time ago when you were just getting started, to right now, you are, I mean, you seem exactly the same to me. I can still <laughs> drunk FaceTime you and you'll pick up, which is my no definitely doubt. my litmus test. It's my favorite part of my week, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I don't do it every week, but I do it often enough. No, I, I, <laughs> I don't want people to think I'm a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, me and Lauren love it so much. Um, and, and I would say the same about you. Not, I mean, mm-hmm. not that this is like a mm-hmm. compliment back yeah. and forth type thing, but I, it is very, very true. Like, you, you are one of the most down-to-earth people that I've ever met, especially mm-hmm. – with the, you're in front of the world every single day, um, yeah. and so it, when I when I describe my my being under a microscope, you are a million times more <laughs> than that. But I remember when Lauren and I first got married. Um, we, we I mean, I, I think I maybe had five hundred bucks to my name, and my dad had just bought a condo, and I told him like we can't pay rent, and so he just made us pay the HOA fee, which was like forty five dollars a month, and even that hurt. It was our first Christmas as a married couple. I just signed a record deal. And uh, we lived across the street from a, um, a Harris Teeter, which I don't know if y'all have those up there, but it was like a grocery store. And like, I'm talking about five nights a week, we would buy a frozen pizza and the cheapest bottle of wine we could find. Mm-hmm. And like, and we'd go to the Christmas tree lot. And I remember Lauren, I was like, why don't we just go to freaking Target and buy, you know, a $9 fake Christmas tree? And she's mm-hmm. like, well, because I've always had a real one. And uh-huh. Christmas trees are like 70 bucks. <laughs> You know what I mean? A tree is $70. And I remember calling my business manager at the time being like, hey, can I afford this? And we went back and put that Christmas tree up and made a frozen pizza and had a bottle of wine. And you want to talk about content yet proud that that we had accomplished that. Well, you and Lauren uh, met when you were little and then ended up getting married after you guys have lived a little. But you were you all were both young and people were telling you, what are you doing? You looked like 22 or something. Yeah, we were 22 when we got married for sure. Yeah. Did everyone who tried to talk you out of it? Um, I don't think it was like a, a talking out of. It was more yeah. of just like, make sure, make sure. You know what I mean? Which is yeah. which is normal. You know, I think for a parent to say to a kid, like I might say the same thing. You know, when, yeah. if if my daughters were like, "Hey, I'm 17 and I found the guy I want to marry," I'm yeah. like, "Are you sure?" You know, positive. <laughs> but I can also be like, you know what? If that's your heart and that's what you believe, like, here to support you. You know. So you um, were sure, and she was sure. We were sure, but we also knew each other for since like third grade you yeah. know what i mean like she knew me as a sixth grader as a 10th grader um as an idiot in college i mean she 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 was with me through every every up and down phase of life and so when we got married we were already best friends anyway and they you know my parents had always said make sure you marry your best friend you know and mm-hmm. i was like well i mean this is uh this is my best friend and she is very attractive and i'm <laughs> i'm i'm here for it and uh but, you know, I think, like, at that time, it, it wasn't super cool to be married and be a uh, a country singer. You know what I mean? And I yeah, just thought that was the stupidest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, And it was kind of weird. Like, at the time, I guess this would have been 2012. I mean, there were love songs, but, like, there, there weren't, there weren't, like, a lot of love songs about, like, from a 
from a country singer being like, y'all know who this is, and this is who I'm singing about. This is my wife. Yeah, this is you for know? her, right. Um, from the get-go of my career, Lauren was just such a part of, I mean, we were a package deal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, she came to, she was at every show. The fans knew her. Mm-hmm. Everybody knew her. And so when Die Happy Man came out, like, yeah, I think the song, I think Die Happy Man is good. But I think that it was great at the time because it hadn't been done in a while in that way. And it was almost like the stars kind of lined up for that song. With all I got is your hand in my hand. Baby, I could die a happy man. Your parents are divorced. Yeah. Were you scared getting married? Did you think our, our patterns, do they repeat? Like, were you worried? Um... Yeah, I mean, there was a part of me that was just like, is is that going to be me too? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah. I remember, you know, Lauren's dad, he flies like uh, jets for a living. Like, he owns oh. like a charter company in Nashville. And, you know, in the 90s, he would fly, you know, you, know, you name that country artist, mm-hmm. he flew him around. And so he'd been around the business for a while. And I remember before me and Lauren got married, he was like, you better keep your head on straight. You know what I mean? He was like, you bet you better not do anything out there on the road because I, I promise you I've seen it and I will call you out immediately. And I was like, you don't have anything to worry about, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. but as I got into it, I, I, I quickly realized how easy that yeah. could be, yeah. um, without the right boundaries mm-hmm. put in place. Did your parents give you, um, advice like, uh, marriage <clears throat> advice? Uh, yeah, for sure. But you know, like, you know, I think like my dad and my mom, were, were different. They they kind of came from that generation of like, you know, they got pregnant before they were married uh-huh. um, in South Georgia. Mm-hmm. And it was like one of those times in life where it was like, well, we should probably get married. You yeah. know what I mean? But I think kind of early on, you know, my, I think my dad really wanted, I think he had more life that he wanted to live. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I think him looking back, like those are things that he may not be um, proud of, but like, mm-hmm. That's that's just life. You know, we that's live life. and we, we live and we learn. And, you know, um, I feel like I got really blessed with, um, with an amazing family that has that has baggage, just like we all do. When do you think your dad was proudest of you? Um, I think he may just be proud of how I have approached this career. I think he writes with people all the time that go, "Man, how'd your son turn out so good?" You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's it's kind of a joke, but I, but I think he, you know, he kind of gets like, you know, my my dad was was pretty wild, you know, back in the day, and uh-huh. and I, I've definitely had my fair share of wild moments. But I knew that when I when I got married, like this was this was the goal. If everything else fell apart, yeah. this this had to stay together, um, and, yeah. and that that is that is what I vowed the day I got married, and that is what I that is what I plan on, you know, committing to until the the day that I die. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together. Allie Jackson now weekdays at five on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Yeah, who's this? What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Well, I know having kids was something that was um, high on your priority list. 
the way you went about it was obviously very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Lauren was on a mission trip to Uganda yeah. and fell in love, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's just how it happened. So she met Willa. What was it about her, about that specific child of all the children yeah. uh, who Lauren met and, and you got to know? What was it about her? Yeah, you know, that was such a, a crazy time because my wife up to that point had um, – had traveled with me and me solely. You know what I mean? Like she kind of she kind of gave up a lot to to be along my side. Mm -hmm. You know, during this journey. I mean, she went to the University of Tennessee, uh, graduated with a nursing degree. Uh, nursing school about killed her, um, as I'm sure many many nurses out there. It's freaking hard. Um, but she finished that, and we went into marriage counseling. And our marriage counselor said, "I think y'all need to be fully together your first year on the road because the year that she graduated, I went on this thing called radio tour, which is where you're gone for like eight months and mm. you're literally visiting every country radio station in the country. So if she had gone and worked in the hospital and I'd gone to do that, our first year of marriage would have been completely just mm -hmm. split apart. And so she decided to come with me that whole first year. And that led into the next, you know, five years of our marriage. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think my wife ever planned on marrying someone that was doing what I'm doing. Like, I think that if she could have picked at that age, she probably would have picked someone that was going to be home at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. and she probably would have lived a whole lot simpler of a life had she done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was just no denying, uh, you know, our love for each other. And to this day, I mean, I, I just, I literally just look at her and say, thank you. Thank you for marrying me because I, I would be a total disaster. <laughs> I, I wrote a song last year called I'd Be a Nightmare Single, um, and it is very true. Um, anyway, to, back to your question. That was when she had met a few people that were already doing work in Uganda, and I think my wife at that point had felt a little bit um, passionless, if mm -hmm. you will. I, like, I think she felt like her passions had to be my passions. Mm -hmm. Um and so we had a that was like a year of like a long conversation of like, well, what, you know, what, what is your passion? And she was like, well, I still want to help people medically. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I want to, mm -hmm. I want to use the skill that I trained so hard for. And I was like, well, that is a hundred percent understandable. Mm -hmm. like, let's figure that out. You know, and kind of a, a God thing that she met, uh, this woman named Suzanne who, uh, was already doing ministry and, and, um, mission work in, in Uganda and Lauren went with her and I was still back in America, you know, doing shows and. I remember she sent me a, a picture of this little girl, and uh, in Uganda they had they had named her Blessing. That was the that was the name that they gave her. She didn't have any parents, and uh, and no no siblings um, that that we knew of. And she sent me a picture of her holding Blessing, and she said, "We have got to help, you know, find her family or find find mm -hmm. her a home." And uh, you know, they did a ton of research on, you know where where she was found all this kind of stuff and and it was just it was heartbreaking you know like i i can't imagine i don't know one, like one of my children just not not having a family to call mm -hmm. to call home you know and and so i just it just can't i don't even remember saying it but it came out of my mouth i was like we'll we'll we will we'll bring her home you know mm -hmm. and my wife was like are you serious and yeah. next thing you know you know we're what why were you so sure what was it about that image I've just never seen my wife glow the way that she was glowing. Like, yeah, I, I can't, I can't describe it, but it already felt like it was a thing. I don't remember saying it; it just, it just erupted out of my stomach, just like happened. And, uh, and then I, you know, we hung up the phone, and I was like, "What did I just say?" Like, and um, because I don't know that I was ready to be a dad yet. I don't think anyone's ready to be a parent until you are. You know until what I'm saying? You are. Um, that kind of makes me um, like I, I feel like whenever the truth is told like I get this weird wave of emotion yeah. like I get chills and I feel it and you that statement you just made there was like a was like a, a tidal wave for me <laughs> yeah. it was a God moment you said yeah for that's sure. really really big so you got Willa Gray and and then Lauren gets pregnant then y'all are off and running you got four girls now yeah do you want a boy I think I've passed that point to be honest with you <laughs> I think uh, that's like the most question I get asked is like, when are you yeah. trying again? I mean, Lauren's whole dream, she wanted to have five kids. Like that's, five, since yeah. the day we got married, she's like, I want to have five. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> that's fine. You know, yeah. <laughs> five would be great. But we sit there and we go, you know, they're all in such different phases of life. Mm. <laughs> We're having a hard time figuring out how do we make one-on-one -on -one time right. for like all of our kids, for, you know? So, you now. so I told Lauren, I was like, I mean, let's have five, but let's, let's take a, let's take a four year deep breath. <laughs> so... 
Yeah, exactly. She'll get her five eventually, but you're right. Sometimes you need a minute. As you know, I adopted two children. And a lot of questions come up, which I'm already getting from Haley, and I will get from Hope, too. What questions is Willa Gray asking or are your other daughters asking? And how have you guys navigated that? Because I've got two kids from different countries, and, you know, it's there are questions that pop. Yeah, it's hard, you know, because I I think I think when you become a parent, you you're like, well, I'm a dad. I have all the answers, you know, or I'm a mom. I have all the answers. Um, And like adoption is is one of the most beautiful things in the world. And I I don't think at the beginning of it, you I don't think you go, oh, in like six years, I'm going to start answering some like really. Yes. Really intense questions, you know, and and I think I don't know if you felt this at all, but it's kind of like you go, well, what age? Mm -hmm. Like what age is the right age? You know what I mean? Because the world is moving so fast that it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, to have a conversation with a six-year-old about that, maybe I'm too old school to think that way, but I go, maybe we need to wait till she's 10. And I I love the innocence that they have because they don't have any, they haven't been tainted yet by the world. They haven't been jaded by the world. Like they they don't, they don't see things like adults Mm -hmm. see things. And so in in your parent brain, you're like, well, how do I keep this innocence alive as mm-hmm. long as I possibly as can. As long as possible, yeah. You know, because I mean, I feel like I read the Bible and God's like, well, you, if, if you're not, if you don't have the heart of a child, you're not, you ain't doing it right. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how could I have the heart of a child when we're at war and we're at, we're, this is right. happening and that's happening right, and like, right. and they don't, they don't know any of that stuff yet, you know? Yeah. And so we really just try to, we try to be as honest as we can without the confusion. And how has uh, Thomas having four daughters impacted you as a husband to Lauren? I just had to sit back and like reprioritize my life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. if music was number one for the last eight years, music is now like number three. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like I love it and I want to be great at it. But like if me being great at music makes my parenting and my husband <laughs> role suffer, yeah, what's it worth when I'm 50? What's it worth? Yeah, you know what I mean? You're right. You're right. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. I remember interviewing you when you hadn't won an award and it was all brand new, and now you're just such a staple and such a name. What what is it like now when you stand up on a stage and the stadium is full? Is it like what it was before? What does it feel like for you? I still pinch myself, yeah. um, and I'm also I'm also a perfectionist. I think in some good ways, but mostly a fault, um, mm-hmm. which maybe maybe leads back to my comparison issue uh-huh. because I, I walk out there and I go, gosh, this place holds fifteen thousand people, but there's there's 14,900 here. <laughs> like, I'm like, where's the other hundred at? You know what I mean? Like, but, but then I walk out there and I go, golly, it feels like yesterday that I was 21 years old, yeah. you know, opening for who, whoever it was. Were you competitive about everything? Like, did you play sports when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah. So you very, always wanted to win. Very yeah. competitive. Yeah. With everything? That's just your, in your DNA? Yeah, like I have this weird fear of just like not not being the best. 
I, and I don't know where that comes from, but it but it happens in every area of my life. Like I can go back and remember playing. I was playing Monopoly with Lauren when we were sixteen years old, <laughs> and she's really good at math. And I'm real like I just learned how to tip three years ago, um, <laughs> and she beat me. And I was like, I don't want to play Monopoly Monopoly with you anymore. <laughs> You're so crazy. And even with my hobbies, like when I when I get into a hobby, yeah, I go hard. Like well, what? Give me a hobby. Fly fishing, hunting, oh, yeah. skiing. Yeah. Like, I got to have the best equipment. I got to watch a million YouTubes. I got to hire a, a trainer. We need to get into this. What is this? <laughs> no, this is deep in your psyche since you know, you're a kid? Yeah. And, like, I think I'm, I'm about to go on a kind of a weird tangent, mm-hmm. but I'm getting to a point. I, I think the reason I hate hate so bad and, like, mm-hmm. Instagram hatred or mm-hmm. just even posting a song and someone being like, this sucks. Yeah. Like that should be able to roll off my back. Yeah. But it doesn't. Like it sticks with me for weeks. Yeah. And I go back into my sixth grade self. Yeah. And like I was kind of a, I won't say an outcast, but I was, uh, I just wanted to be different than everybody else. You know what I mean? Like if it was cool to play football, I wanted to start a lacrosse team. Uh If it was cool, if it was cool to listen to the Backstreet Boys, I wanted to listen to the Ramones. Uh-huh. And I was in sixth grade, and me and some buddies started a punk rock band. And on the night of prom, we scheduled our first concert because we were like anti-prom. You know what I mean? Probably because we didn't get asked or no one wanted to go with us. That was probably the real reason. But I remember we put these flyers up in the hallway, like come to see the high heel flip-flops at whoever's house. Yeah. And there was somebody on the football team that went through the hallway and ripped all of our flyers down uh-huh. and just started shredding them in half. Uh-huh. And that was the first moment that I said, I will be better than that. I will always be a bigger person than that. I'm about to cry and talk about it, but I I don't know if that was where my uh, desire to prove people wrong so much came into play, but I, I I can go back in my brain and see that so vividly. And so anytime anyone does something unique or weird or different in country music, in pop music, in sports, in whatever... When someone wants to tear somebody down for something, I'm like, you need to sit down. Sit down. Because yes. you don't know. I know we, we've been talking about life and it makes me so happy, but let <laughs> me just get to your music because yeah. I feel like it's evolving too. You were writing songs before you were singing them uh, publicly. Yeah. And you still had, like, I was surprised at such a young age you had so much stuff to say. Like, I didn't even know you lived enough life to say those things, and now <laughs> they're getting deeper even yet. But I feel like you must have lived a lot of life uh, even when, when, you, when you were young. Yeah, I feel like I did. You know, like, I, I mean, I think, you know, our li- every, every bit of trauma in our lives shapes us in a way, you know, whether – and you get to choose for the worse or the better, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, d- divorce is not a fun thing to go through, mm-hmm. you know, as a kid. And for a long time, I didn't think it affected me until I started to become an adult. And I started to pull out little bits of pieces of how mm-hmm. that did affect me. And, you know, uh, knowing Lauren and knowing certain people in our lives that had passed away way too early, like you kind of go, well, that's just life. But then you go, no, like that sucks. That and sucks. That, that affected yeah. you, you know. And yeah. I think I've always just been a really old soul. Um, mm-hmm. like I think I've always been an overthinker and thought about my future probably way more than your average 18 or 19 year old kid, mm-hmm. you know? Um, mm-hmm. and so at a young age, like I really was trying to be older than my, my driver's license said, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. which is a good song title. We'll write that together. Yeah, um, that's a good one. <laughs> I've always just wanted to make sure that whatever I said, I mean, I've definitely released songs that were just for fun and just for yeah, you to dance course. to. But for the most part, if you hand me a guitar, I, I do want to write something, uh, meaningful you know and and something that someone across the world can hear by accident and be like man i've i've felt that i've I've been there Uh i've had that heartbreak i've had that joy you know um Uh and so a lot of people ask like why i get so personal in my songs and it's like really the only way i know how to do it you know like i've tried to write a quote unquote just like a hit you know Mm -hmm. like oh this Mm -hmm. would sound good on the radio and i've definitely had a few of those but for the most Mm -hmm. part if I can write my honest truth and it be a hit, that is mm-hmm. uh, that's the mecca, there, right there. So well, uh, Thomas, I just want to say it's always such a treat to visit and talk with you. Likewise, I love your music. We're gonna be just it, it's my happy place, man. <laughs> I hit Thomas Rhett Radio, Thomas Thomas Rhett on Spotify, and um, I just can't wait to to see you soon. 
Well, likewise, Hoda. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so All much right, for talking too. with me. Thanks again. I'm going to make some slices here. Good job. You okay? Welcome to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal. In this Today All Day series, I'm looking back at some of my favorite Cooking with Cal recipes and sharing my top kitchen tips. Today's episode is one that we're calling Grandma's Greatest because it features recipes from two amazing grandmas. First up, you'll see me and Calvin whipping up my mom's pasta salad, and then we tackle my grandmother's short ribs. You know, one of the biggest obstacles timid cooks face in the kitchen is just not knowing where to start or what to make. Well, here's a good rule of thumb. Always cook what you know and what you loved growing up. Just think back to what your parents and grandparents always served. I've also found that family recipes are often the simplest, which is probably why our parents made them so often. This first recipe is proof of that. You only need five ingredients, pasta, canned tomatoes, black olives, parsley, and olive oil. Take a look. All right, so let's get the ingredients ready. How this thing works, we're gonna use a can of tomatoes. But these are cooked tomatoes, they're not raw tomatoes. So you'll like these, because they're cooked tomatoes, okay? Now turn that as hard as you can. Use those muscles. Do you want some help? Do you know what these are? What? Olives. Black olives. Black on taste one, you haven't tried one in a long time. Ollie loves them. Ollie loves olives. A little bit. I love them. I could eat them like this. So we got our tomatoes, our olives. You know what this is? What? Got some parsley. All right, you want to chop this for me? Why don't you put your hand like that? There we go. Good job. Now I'm just gonna make these all a little smaller, okay? This adds a nice pop of green and a nice freshness to the whole dish. So a lot of times my mom would use elbow noodles, the ones that look like C's or U's as you call them. I felt like using tricolor pasta. You know why they call it tricolor pasta? Why? Because there's three colors. So this one is just made with wheat. This one has tomato in it. And what do you think's in this one if it's green? Broccoli. Close. What else is green? What's green and leafy? Celery. Well, celery has some leaves. What looks like lettuce? Spinach. Yay! Cool. I'm gonna dump this in, okay? Oh, that is well, that's boiling. Can you dump a can of tomatoes in here? Now all of the olives. The parsley. Ah, good call, buddy. Good idea. Now we wait. Can you taste that? Mm. Mm. Perfect. All right. Draining the noodle. All right, I want to pour these into this bowl. Dump a whole bunch of olive oil in here. All of it? Not all of it. I'll tell you what. All around. Swirl it all around. A little salt. This will come out fast, so let's not. Let's give it a big stir. Before we put this in the fridge to let it cool down, let's taste it, okay? Mm -hmm. You like it? it? Tastes even better when it's cold. So I thought this was such an easy recipe, but you guys had a lot of questions about it, so let's get to them. First, what's the last seasoning you put on the salad? Just salt and pepper. I think there's not a lot of seasoning or anything that goes into this salad, so if I sprinkle anything on it, it's, it's really just salt and pepper. I'm a big fan of salt and pepper. Next question, did you drain the tomatoes? Uh, no, I put the whole can with the diced tomatoes and the liquid because some of the pasta absorbs some of that liquid, so um, it, it helps to add some moisture to the dish. Another viewer asked, do you think it would still be tasty without the olives? Yes, the thing that's the best part about this recipe is this is just a base. If you don't like olives, if you don't like parsley, leave them out. If you wanna put some cube cheese in there or some pepperoni, throw that in. Uh, really, it's just about a base. And if you like it a little tangier, you could probably throw in some Italian dressing. It's, it's just a basic, basic pasta salad. This is the way we always made it, but feel free to change it up however you want. 
Another question about olives, are they sliced black olives? Yes, I kept this recipe even simpler by buying the actual pre-sliced black olives, um, but you can buy regular olives and slice them up. I bet if you like it tangy, it would even taste good with green olives too. And another question about the tomatoes. What brand of tomatoes do you use? I'm not uh, that loyal to a particular brand, uh, but I do love San Marzano tomatoes whenever you can find them, whether you're using diced tomatoes or you're using you know, crushed tomatoes to make a sauce. San Marzano tomatoes are just a little bit sweeter, so you don't have to add the sugar to them, and they just, they're, they're straight from Italy, and they're just absolutely delicious. Slightly more expensive, but totally worth it, I promise. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel phone? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. This episode is all about celebrating family recipes passed down from generation to generation. And Kelvin absolutely loves his grandma's recipe for pasta salad, and I absolutely love my grandma's recipe for short ribs. So my grandmother lived in an apartment that my dad built above our garage in our house. So it was always special when we kind of walked up the stairs to my grandmother's apartment for dinner. Her home was always warm, and cozy and it always just smelled so good whether it was you know beef and barley soup or these short ribs i just remember it was always like a meat and potatoes or a hearty dish and we'd all just sit around at her brown dining room table and it just it was just special we were still home but we were over graham's house eating one of her recipes and they were always so delicious for this recipe you'll need short ribs paprika chili powder poultry seasoning onion, tomato paste, egg noodles, peas, and salt and pepper. Say hi, Mammy. Hi, Mammy. Hi, Cal. Hi, How Mammy. are you today? I asked you for the recipe, and you said, you know, you just throw the meat in a dish, you throw this together, you put it on top, you, you cover it for a little, you cook it for a little. There was no written instructions with the recipe, so a lot depended on looking at it, seeing what it's doing, throw it in the oven a little bit longer. That kind of thing. Well, I wish you could be here with me to help make this and, and especially eat it with us. It'll be a tight squeeze, but we'll see if we can get them all here. Okay. There we go. They're all squeezed in there, right? Yeah. One, two, three. Salt, pepper. Now we have to slice up an onion. Oh, what if it hurts my eye? 
I know. Can I close my eyes? Well, then it's hard to cut and close your eyes at the same time. Okay. I'm gonna make some slices here. Good job. You okay? We've got all kinds of spices here, okay? Are we gonna mix them up? Yeah, but first, I want you to scoop all of this tomato paste into here as well, okay? okay. And you pour this water in there. I cannot do it. Because you're here to help me. Okay, so now we're gonna pour all of this, all over our short ribs. Now we're gonna bake them. <laughs> now we're gonna bake them, you're right. So all we have to do, we're gonna cover this with foil. We're gonna bake it for like 45 minutes. 45 minutes, I have to right? <laughs> That's right. Put it back in the oven without the foil so it finishes cooking. Where's the noodle? This tastes exactly like my grandma's. Is hers yummy? Hers is so yummy. One of the questions I get asked all the time is what are the tools you use with Calvin in the kitchen? And knives are the big question because I'm cooking with a kid and here he is chopping some vegetables. So when I first started cooking with Calvin, I did all the chopping. I didn't want him anywhere near a knife. He did the stirring, he did the breaking of the eggs, he did all that. Then once he wanted to participate more, I found these knives. Um, they're plastic knives, you can find them anywhere online. So they're, they're sharp enough to cut, but they're not really sharp enough that Calvin would cut his finger. <laughs> so the best vegetables this works for are something like zucchini, something like cooked potatoes. Uh, hard boiled egg would be good, soft fruits like berries or pears, and you know, it takes, takes a little little bit of strength but at least it you know is not going to hurt them and it kind of just gets them used to you know some knife skills I would also you know kind of do this for Calvin I chop this up with my knife and then just give him a little bit to just sort of learn how to rock the knife learn how to keep his hands out of the way and just really basic knife skills with with soft fruits and vegetables that's what these knives are good for Eventually, it became a thing though where you know, you're making soup and you're chopping some harder stuff like carrots and onions. So I needed to upgrade a little bit and I found these great knives. This is an actual knife. I mean, it's, it's sharp and it will cut through your hard vegetables. But the thing I love about it is it also comes with this shield. So it teaches you the proper way to cut. So Calvin can put his hand here and he learns, you know, you stick your finger through this hole so he learns you know not to put his finger under here so his hand placement is good on the knife and then he learns to kind of rock but look at how this is like a real sharp knife for a kid but it's all safe the hand that's holding the knife knows how to hold it properly the hand that's holding the food knows how to hold it properly so that your fingers are kept out of the way the thing I love about this brand is that it also comes with a peeler Calvin loves apples and pears. Obviously he loves carrots, but he does not like the skin on anything. He'd peel a blueberry if he could. So the same kind of thing. You stick your finger in the hole and then it teaches you to just have your fingers out of the way. So my job is to make sure he holds, you know, the right end and isn't like, you know, doing it the wrong way. And this thing's role is to make sure Calvin holds this the right way. So you can see how sharp they are, they work. So once your kid masters the plastic knife, I think it's good to upgrade to the real deal. The next time you go to your parents or your grandparents' house, look through their recipe boxes. You may just find some delicious gems that you totally forgot about. But until then, I hope you'll try my family recipes 
and let me know what you think. For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. So first, what you're going to need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and shredded <laughs> mozzarella cheese. <laughs> My name is Peyton Janicki, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. I'm Peyton Janicki, I'm eight years old, and I'm in third grade. My earliest memory of cooking is when I was younger, I used to help my grandma make apple and pumpkin pies for Thanksgiving. I love cooking with my grandma because she's very nice and she's also a really good cook and at the end I get to eat it. <laughs> we need to add some chicken broth um, with a pot of oil in it. Um, and you need to let that sit before we add the couscous. My favorite thing about having my YouTube channel, Practically Peyton, it's basically just cooking and just like, it's not even, it's not even hard for me. It's, it's really fun. I love to cook for my mom, my dad, and my little brother, Michael. I also bake for my dog sometimes. For his first birthday, I helped bake him a cake. And it was basically just dog food, but shaped into like a bone shape. And it also came with some icing for dogs. He loved it so much. Some of my favorite hobbies are softball, swimming, dance, basketball, singing, and piano. When I grow up, there's three things that I might want to be. I want to be a teacher, a chef, and an art teacher because I love to do art. I think that cooking is basically kind of like art. I might put in the wrong ingredient and I still want to see how it turns out. It's basically like mixing paint colors. Today I'm so excited because I get to show you how to make Nanny's stuffed chicken breast and roasted broccoli. A couple of years ago, my Nanny's created this recipe because she was really good at making chicken cutlets and she knew one of my favorite foods was pepperoni. So she magically put the pepperoni in the chicken cutlets and it was amazing. Okay guys, let's get started. I'm so excited. Make sure you preheat the oven to 425 degrees. First thing is we are going to line this cookie sheet with foil and then we're gonna spray it with some non-stick baking spray. I love using foil because it makes cleanup super easy. The first ingredients that you're gonna need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and shredded mozzarella cheese. I like using shredded mozzarella cheese because you don't have to shred it. And it's just like so hard shredding it and you can get hurt shredding it. In a small bowl, I'm going to add breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and mozzarella cheese. This is my topping. The cheese and the olive oil are going to make the chicken brown, crispy, and delicious. So now you're gonna grab your thin chicken breast, salt, pepper, mozzarella cheese, pepperoni, and sour cream. The thinner the chicken breast, the better, because we're kind of making a pepperoni sandwich. And the bun is the chicken. Place half of the chicken breast on the prepared foil. Now we're gonna season it with salt and pepper. This is like sprinkling fairy dust. 
Now we're going to sprinkle it with a half a cup of shredded mozzarella cheese. You want to make sure you spread it evenly throughout the four chicken breasts. You don't want to skip out on the cheese. My brother loves cheese, so I think I'm going to give him a little bit extra. He'll thank me later. My favorite step of this whole thing, adding the pepperoni. So you want to add three pieces of pepperoni on each slice, each piece of chicken. What I love most about pepperoni is probably like it has like a little spice to it. It has like a little hotness. I love pepperoni so much. I even eat it for breakfast sometimes. And secretly I try to sneak it into all of my recipes. Now we're gonna place the other half of the chicken on top of all of these pieces of chicken. Now we're going to put a thin layer of sour cream onto the chicken. This has a really good flavor, it, and it also helps make the breadcrumbs stick to the chicken. It's kind of like frosting in a cake. Now we are going to put the breadcrumb mixture on top of the chicken. I like this breadcrumb mixture because it makes the chicken like nice and crispy, and it gives a different but good flavor. See, this is the magic of the sour cream because it's sticking perfectly. This is looking so good, I can't wait to eat it. Now it's time to put this in the oven. It looks great, but I can't do it since I'm a kid, so I need help from my dad. Dad! Now we're gonna bake that for 20 minutes, and in the meantime, I'm going to bake one of my most favorite side dishes, roasted broccoli. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? From Brooklyn, we're next 
of the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Fun fact, it is actually like when you get any vegetable and put salt, pepper, olive oil, and garlic powder like on top of it and bake it, it'll taste amazing. I actually won't eat broccoli any other way. I always bake it this way and I love it. Now the first thing we're gonna do is cut the broccoli into florets, but you can also just pull them apart and then you can have a parent cut it a little bit more after. Now that we're getting to the middle, I'm just gonna leave this for mom. Mom, can you come help me? Let's cut the broccoli. Make sure they're at a similar size so they roast evenly. Well, you're a fast cutter. Now, you're gonna add olive oil. Salt. Pepper. And garlic powder. Now you wanna mix this really well. And cooking can get messy, so Do it with your hands. It feels like, I don't know, like, have you ever like felt foam beads for like slime? It feels like that, but like wet and a little bit like more like crunchy. You wanna make sure they're in one row or layer because if it's not, it'll just steam instead of getting all like crispy and delicious. It's time to put this baby in the oven, but I need help. Dad? Now we have to wait 10 minutes. It's starting to smell so good, so that's a good sign. I'm getting super hungry too. Look at how amazing this looks. It looks so delicious. The chicken, it looks so crispy and good. And the broccoli, it look, the same. It, it looks very crispy and good. It just, I imagine it in my mouth. Tasting so good. All right, let's plate it. I'm gonna play another one because I have a special guest. I can't wait until she arrives. She's gonna love this meal. Oh my gosh, perfect timing, she's here. what you were sniffing when you just came in. Oh, I can't wait to eat it. Thank you so, thank you so much. You're welcome. You did a great job. Mm. You make this exactly like I did. Okay, let's Actually, see how it tastes. Yours, I think, tastes even better. <laughs> it's so delicious. I love sharing meals with you. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> even if it's not this dish. <laughs> I love you so much. I love you too. I loved having you guys in the kitchen today. I hope you'll keep this recipe in mind and share it with someone special too.
this morning a remarkable team of history makers. Yes, yes. The Full Circle Everest Expedition recently became the first all-black climbing group to summit the world's tallest mountain. We're going to talk to them in just a few moments. We're looking forward to that. But first, a little bit more on their remarkable journey and their hopes that it will inspire future generations of climbers. It was a groundbreaking moment on top of the world's highest peak. Seven members of the Full Circle Everest Expedition celebrating their successful summit, all while making history as the first all-black climbing group to reach the top of Mount Everest. Team leader Phil Henderson sharing the good news on Instagram, writing in part, all members of the Climb and Sherpa teams have safely returned to base camp where we will celebrate this historic moment. After ascending Mount Rainier in Washington last year, the team set its sights to greater heights, and for months they worked toward their Everest goal, documenting their journey along the way. The team left base camp on May 2nd to start the climb, and after a week, they shared their progress, posting on Instagram. After countless hours of training, preparing, and dedication, the team is getting ready to make a push for the summit. Three days later, their perseverance paid off, and in one expedition, they nearly doubled the number of black climbers who have reached the peak. But for the team, scaling Mount Everest was always more than just an experience. Their intent was to inspire the next generation of outdoor enthusiasts in black communities. Climber Fred Campbell sharing the team's mission statement on today. I hope that they see our experience and how much we love being out on the mountain and kind of enjoying the adventure. And they're inspired to find an adventure of their own. Now, one team's path to success, a symbol of how to make dreams a reality. Well, now let's meet some of the team. <laughs> They're celebrating this morning. Rosemary Saul and Manoa Anu were two of the climbers who summited. And Philip Henderson is the leader of the group who was on the mountain and saw his vision fulfilled when seven members of the team reached the summit. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. We're thrilled to have you. We know it's evening time there, and you guys are celebrating a successful <laughs> summit. I'll start with you, Manoa. Um, you're a professional climber, but this was your first time at the top of Everest. Did it meet your expectations? Yeah, I exceeded. Exceeded. What's yeah, it it's, like it's really amazing here. Uh, up there, yeah, it's a little cold. So. <laughs> <laughs> there is a little thin, but, you know, down here and you know, on the journey through, yeah, to to the top of the world. Every place is amazing. Everyone is amazing. So, um, yeah, it's all good. Rosemary, it, this is like a, a huge personal accomplishment for you, but it's also a big accomplishment for African Americans in general. We we're talking about how only 10 African Americans have ever done this, what you guys did. What does it mean to you, and what does it mean in a greater sense? Absolutely. And I'd say it's even uh, bigger, as you said, only 10 African Americans. I think that's 10 black folks globally. So not even necessarily even fewer than that um, African Americans have made it to the summit. Uh, but yeah, this is a huge accomplishment uh, just for each of us on our team, for the full circle team, for our Sherpa team, for all of the support that we've had. Um, and now we're able to take this experience and take it back to our communities um, and tell the stories, share what we've learned of this beautiful place and culture, um, and hopefully inspire a future generation of outdoor enthusiasts. No doubt you will. Phil, uh, this, this is your group. You're the, you're the team leader. I explain to folks why this was so important for you. Why, why were you uh, so hell-bent on, on getting folks to the top of Everest? Well, there's a, a number of reasons, but one, you know, I mean, I've been working in the in the industry now, the industry for almost three decades, and when I came into it, you know, there weren't folks like myself that I had to, to look to, you know, for guidance and mentorship and so on, and not that I haven't had mentors, but I, you know, after three decades, I kind of found myself in that place to, to mentor, you know, different members of this team and so on, and so that's a part of it, but the other part is that you know, I've had a relationship with people in Nepal and the Sherpa community, and I've helped train a lot of them in their in their craft of working as high altitude workers. And I just wanted to really share my love and my community with the Sherpa people, with the community that I have at home as well. So uh, it was really important in a lot of ways. Yeah. I want to congratulate all of you. You're on top of the world in every way, and thank you so much for inspiring others. Here, here. 
Thank you oh, so thank much. You for having thank us. you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Keep celebrating, okay? Yes. <laughs> we heard there were a couple more. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there you go. Cheers. No need to hide those. When you say it's five o'clock somewhere, it literally That's is true. It's five o'clock yeah, so. If you recall, last week we brought you the incredible story of the first all black team of climbers to ever summit Mount Everest. Up until two weeks ago, only 10 African Americans had ever reached the top. That number has nearly doubled in size thanks to seven members of Full Surf Circle Everest Expedition. Yeah, and this morning they're here with us. Their first live in-person interview. We've seen them on Zoom, but it's good to welcome you in person. Yes. The history making team. All right, real quick, we want to get everyone's name. Give me your first and last name. Uh, Philip Henderson. Rosemary Saul. Evan Green. Manoa Anu'u. Eddie Taylor. Thomas Moore. <laughs> Abby Dion. Fred Campbell. Adina Scott. Everyone yeah, got yeah. a little air time. Woo, we had to start that way. <laughs> All right, guys. So this was your idea. Yes, ma'am. What did it feel like to finally see it come to fruition? You've been thinking about this for a long time now. Yeah, just proud. Just feel really proud of the team, you know, and the accomplishments that, you know, we've been working for almost three years to make it happen. Do you ever have any doubt? No, not at all. Wow. No doubt. Philip, I, I want to ask you something. You you could have summoned it to the top, yes. but instead you gave your spot to Evan. Why? You know, it, there was a lot of logistics and things that need to happen, and every Everest expedition has a manager that manages things in base camp and the whole team. And I felt like if I focused on personal climbing, then that would be selfish. Uh, and they really needed me to, to be in that position, so I just decided not to climb. Wow. Y'all remember, so cool. you remember Rosemary, don't you? She oh, had a you, had, you had a cocktail. You were celebrating the last yeah, we, time. We were, yes. <laughs> Have you had a chance to sort of sit with what you did and re reflect on that moment? Um, you know, a little bit. With each passing day, we have a bit more time to just think about what happened. And still in the process of really realizing the accomplishment that, that just happened. And it, it's still sinking in. It's still sinking in, yeah. What was the hardest part of this? Uh, for me, it was more of a marathon, you know, it was almost a two-month expedition, so it was just in it for the long haul and the process of moving up to the different camps, and the summit day was just one piece of the picture. Mm -hmm. Phil, but just a few seconds here that we have left, what can we do to help break this barrier of access for people of color to be able to get outdoors, to be able to learn how to climb and, and do all this? What's necessary? This, <laughs> people getting out and doing it, you know, and showing folks that we belong out there as well. Mother Nature doesn't care what color you are, you know, but you need to get out and it's healing. It's a healing for all of us. So, yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, Very Adina, inspiring. You know, hike to the base camp wearing those. That's not true. The football. Oh, yeah. 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 She did. She did. She did. She did. For real? Is this true? Uh -huh. Oh, my God. Oh, like Whoa. That. All right. We can't wait to see what y'all do next. Now, tomorrow, that remarkable story that first captured the world's mm -hmm. attention last week. It's a Florida man. He landed that plane with zero flying experience after the pilot suddenly became unconscious. Well, the details that initially emerged were already stunning. And now in a Today exclusive, Darren Harrison is sharing what happened inside that cockpit, describing a flight more harrowing and even more inspiring than we could have imagined. I knew it was a life or death situation. Either 
you do what you have to do to control the situation or you're going to die. And that's what I did. In the most terrifying moment of his life, Darren Harrison proved calm and collected. I've got a serious situation here. My pilot has gone incoherent. The 39-year-old, whose career focuses on flooring sales, was traveling home from a fishing trip in the Bahamas on board a single-engine Cessna 208. Big a deal. Only two Until others happened. were on board, the pilot and the pilot's yes. friend. My nightmare has always been when I go on flights like this, what happens if something health-wise happens to the pilot? What's going to happen? You've thought about that before. Oh, I've thought about it many a times. Initially, Darren said everything seemed to be normal. And you didn't seem to be a nervous flyer. You, you took a shot at the cockpit with your feet up and back. Yep, I was just back there relaxing. <laughs> but shortly after taking that photo, he heard from the pilot and everything changed. I saw he kind of did a move like this and said, guys, I got to tell you, I don't feel good. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, I got a headache and I'm fuzzy and I just don't feel right. And I said, what do we need to do? And at that point, he didn't respond at all. He was already done. What was the position of his body in that moment? He was still leaned back. So he, didn't, he never slumped forward? Correct. Never slumped forward at all. At that point, he wasn't responding to us yelling at him. So I moved to the front. And by the time I had moved forward to the front of the airplane, I realized that we had now gone into a dive at a very fast rate. All I saw when I came up to the front was water out the right window and I knew it was coming quick. The plane is in a nose dive essentially. Correct. Yes. And at that point I knew if I didn't react that that we would die. And so I reached over his body because he's at this point unresponsive. I kind of put my arm over to where my elbow is sitting here and I grabbed the controls of the airplane and slowly started to pull back on the stick and turn. How did you know how to do that? Just common sense, I guess, being on airplanes, because I knew if I went up and yanked that the airplane would stall. And I also knew at the rate we were going, we were probably going way too fast, and it would rip the wings off the airplane. Let's just stop for one minute right there before you talk to any air traffic controller, before you put on any headset, the pilot is still in the seat. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a miracle right there. That's the scariest part of the whole story. Defying death in that moment was just the first miracle that day. Darren then found himself in the pilot's seat over open ocean with no flight experience and at first, no way to call for help. I now have the availability to climb into the seat to fly the airplane. I sit down and I'm trying to put on the headset that the pilot was wearing. And so I pull on the wires and I pull up and they're all frayed. The plug's gone off the end of the headphones. And so now I don't have a headset to use. So now your lifeline, you're Correct. literally holding yes. a frayed cord that yes. could be your lifeline to Correct. talk to anyone. Yes. So I immediately <laughs> turn to the guy next to me and say, I'm going to need your headset because I got to talk to somebody. The person on the ground was Captain Bobby Morgan, an air traffic controller and part-time flight instructor. All my GPSs have gone out. I have no idea where I am. And then it was, well, what do you see? I see the state of Florida and I see a small airport. And they said, can you drop to 5,000 and maintain? And I said, I can try, I, I can work on it, but I'm still trying to figure this thing out. You didn't have any shoes on. Nope, I was barefoot. My shoes were in the back. You're practicing going up, yes. going down, yes. getting the feel for the controls. Yes. Yeah, because at some point, the realization sits in of you're going to have to land the airplane. There's only one way to get down. One way. Did it ever cross your mind that, that you wouldn't try? Or was it just like, I can't do this? No. No. When I was flying and saw the state of Florida, at that second, I knew I'm going to land the airplane. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to have to land this airplane because there's no other option. At that point, we turn around and look, and the pilot's still not conscious in the back. With Captain Morgan's guidance, Darren navigated the plane to Palm Beach International Airport. And he kept telling me the whole time that the runway's going to keep getting bigger as you get closer to it. Just keep focused on that and just keep descending. And I remember getting to around 200 feet. And he said, hey, you're going to need to slow down some more. You're still coming in pretty fast. And at that point, I told the other guy, I said, hey, take the throttle and dump it on the floor. 
just dump it on the floor as far as it'll go. Moments later, Darren touched down on the runway. So and then you slammed on those brakes with your bare feet. I slowly, I slowly feathered the brakes as I'm going down the runway. And surprisingly, I felt so comfortable with it. I radioed to the guy and I said, hey, I'm feeling pretty confident in, in, in the brakes and everything. Do you guys want me to turn off the runway so I can clear this thing out? You offered to park. Yeah, yeah. And when did you exhale? I, I said thank you for everything and I threw the headset on the dash and said the biggest prayer I've ever said in my life. It was, that's when all the emotion set in. Can you share what your prayer was? It was a thankful prayer for the safety and everything that had happened. But the last part of the prayer and the strongest part was for the guy in the back. Because I was, I knew it was not a good situation. Yeah. Your thoughts immediately turned to him. Yes, absolutely. And how is he? He is expected to leave the hospital, I believe, on Monday. Wow. Yes. Another miracle. Yes. When they took him to the hospital, he was not expected to live. Once safely on the ground, Darren's first call was to his wife, Brittany, who's pregnant with their first child, a baby girl. Everybody's asked me, like, well, what if you would have crashed and died and you didn't get a chance to tell your wife you loved her? You could have at least called her. You could have reached out to her. You had time. In my mind, I knew I wasn't going to die. And the thought never crossed my mind to call and tell my wife bye. But Brittany feared the worst. I saw his name pop up on my phone. And I always calculate, you know, like when I think he's going to land. I immediately looked at my watch and I was like, he should have 20 more minutes of flight time. So, I mean, honestly, I took a deep breath and prepared myself for it to not be him on the other line. What was it like to hear her voice? It's just, it was one of the biggest reliefs because I was safe. You're seven months pregnant and you have been worrying about your husband for a reason. Yeah, so um, a year ago in April, we lost my brother-in-law uh, while my sister was six months pregnant. And um, I, when I saw his name on the phone, I, I told myself, I said, God, we can't, we can't do this again. I, can't, I don't think I can do it again. And um, thankfully, we didn't have to. Did you think about your little girl? I did. Oh, yeah. It's one of the first things that went through my mind. As I was climbing to the front, and that plane was in a dive, I was just looking, going, I can't die today. I've got Brittany's pregnant, I got a baby on the way. Not today. Today's not my day. An unwavering determination to survive in the air, guided by the heavens. What enabled you to manage in a crisis, a life or death emergency like that, and stay so focused and calm? God. You felt God's presence there? Mm-hmm. Can you explain how? So everybody always asks me, you know, how, how, how did the airplane do what it did? How did it stay together? How did you pull it out? How did you, it's the hand of God was on that plane. Yeah. And on you. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's the only thing I can attribute it to. You know, it's no other explanation for it. I'm speechless. Isn't he oh incredible? God. I know. It, it, was, um, wow. it was such an honor to get to speak to him. He's really incredible. So inspiring. Um, very funny. He also said, I said, are you like a calm person? Is yeah. that kind of yeah. your thing? And he said, no. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, he said, actually, in fact, as a youngster, I was kind of hot-headed. He's like, I've been working on my dad and going to church and Bible study trying to calm down. <laughs> um, but it's pretty incredible. The other thing, and we'll talk about it in the third hour, but um, now, look, we're not, we're, we're all aerospace engineers yeah. now, but it's like you need flaps to land the okay. plane. And he tells this whole story about what happened when he tried to lower the flaps and he ends up flying without flaps. So he lands without okay. flaps, which is a thing. Um, His presence yes. of mind every step of the way. Yes. And the, the fact that he said, today's not my day, to not have that day. kind of calm confidence. Yes. And it really was miracle upon miracle. Yeah. Um, and he, I think he, you know, first of all, it was overwhelming because yeah. suddenly the whole world is calling yeah. him. He goes, yeah. I didn't know there was a Today Show in Australia. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that wasn't my call. But, um, you know, he really wanted to, he, he was so worried for the pilot. Yeah. And he wanted to make sure that that was going to be okay. And it sounds like it is. Be, today might be the day he's out. Yes, huh? I hope so. So it's that was awesome. Really
for breaking news in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are back with our series, Dad's Got This. And recently, I, I talked to a, a truly incredible nurse. He's also a dad, an author, and a podcaster. And he's using his own experiences to show others what it means to be a caregiver. Meet Nurse Papa, a.k.a. David Metzger, a pediatric oncology nurse working at UCSF Children's Hospital in San Francisco. David found his calling as a nurse after falling out of love with his first career as a professional sculptor. Why did you decide to become pediatric nurse what I was doing wasn't feeding my soul in the way I wanted to and you know with my first pediatric patient in that first hour of, of that clinical rotation I ended up taking care of a little girl who didn't have any parents at the bedside and she was crying so I just picked her up and started singing to her and in that moment I realized that she was just afraid and I had this like moment of clarity where I was like oh I could be a pediatric nurse and it's something I could be really good at since his career transitioned to nursing, David has become a father of two, as well as a published author. His debut book, Nurse Papa, 16 Meditations on Parenthood from a Pediatric Oncology Nurse, was released last year. This is a book that, that you were writing on your phone? That's how it started, because uh, you know, I had my phone in my pocket. There are so many ways to be a caregiver, and there's so many ways to be taken care of. I felt it was really important that people had access to these just rarefied situations where there's so much drama and there's so much pain and joy. You know, sometimes these things are unresolved and sometimes people are hurt, but we all keep growing. <laughs> David, are your kids old enough to get their heads around what it is dad does? Oh yeah, I mean, they see me come home in my scrubs you know, every night that I work, and my daughter especially, she's really interested in my patients and what I do. She's always, Papa, tell me about the hospital. Tell me what you did today. I know that my dad is a nurse. Um, he helps kids with cancer. And, you know, that gets tricky sometimes because sometimes it's, it's hard to tell these stories. And I think by being honest with our children and being compassionate and by following their lead about what they want to know, you're preparing them to be, you know, humane, compassionate people. Outside of his weekly nursing shifts at the hospital, David has also been producing and hosting the Nurse Papa podcast. Nurse Papa is brought to you by... Where he answers questions from parents in a segment called Dear Nurse Papa. What I really want to do is to normalize the experience of being a parent. It is not easy. I have made so many mistakes. I think this morning I've made a thousand mistakes with my kids already. I make a lot of mistakes as well. What are some of your more common 
mistakes. Yelling at my kids, I, I really like to, to yell, don't yell. <laughs> <laughs> Stop yelling! Stop yelling! Why are you yelling? <laughs> I think that if you are aware of your mistakes and you know that you acknowledge them, that means that you're doing an okay job. In a nod to his artist background, David always wears a colorful stethoscope decorated with hospital wristbands given to him by his patients over the years. This is uh, 15 years taking care of kids. I mean, this is like my most prized possession. You know, some of these kids are living, some are not, but it's just been a way to remember them. That's a beautiful thing. The sadness and the loss. How do you not take that home with you? You do. <laughs> I mean, it's just part of it. Like, I think that the um, opportunity to be there at bedside with these children, even when they're sick, even when they're dying, has been like the greatest gift that I've ever been given because it's really shown me what life is all about. And it's made me a more complex, caring person. Wow. He's a special man. And you made a good point during the story. I mean, doctors, uh, oncology doctors are obviously, you know, angels Thanks. among us, mm -hmm. but the nurses. Yeah. The nurses are every day. Every day. Every day. Yeah. That's great. Uh, you can search for David's Nurse Pop Up podcast, by the way, wherever you, you listen and get your podcasts. And for more stories about incredible dads, head over to our website, today.com. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Imagine how exciting it must be for kids when one of the world's greatest athletes comes to visit on the last day of school. And <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, exactly. That's what you do That's when awesome. basketball great LeBron James drops by. This is the I Promise School in his hometown God. of Akron, Ohio. He's actually vice principal of the school, which is a partnership between Akron and the LeBron James Family Foundation. King James posed for pictures with kids, teachers too, and later posted some of those scenes from that surprise visit online, wishing the students fun and safe that's summer. pretty awesome. I'm I trying mean, to think of who showed up to our elementary school. Did you have any big names show up? No. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, those, Smokey the Bear one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> those schools are transformative, by the way. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's he does so great work on and off the floor. All right, a lot of people learned new skills and hobbies while they were stuck at home during the pandemic, like a, this little boy. He decided to take up the piano. <laughs> Okay, five-year-old Alberto, he lives in Italy. He started playing the piano when the pandemic began. Both his parents are musicians, and it wasn't long before they realized their son was a prodigy, especially when it came to Mozart. They say they're not strict about making him practice, so he still has time to go to school and play and watch TV and... And, wow. And, and no sheet music, right? I think he's just Look playing. That's incredible. Playing. How can his little hands read oh, yeah. like keys? Little tiny fingers. Impressive. Ooh, the answer's Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. Wow. 
Well, just if, how are you doing? I, I know every day is different. How do you feel today? Yes, I, it's, it is the strange thing about MS. It really, it really is so variable and changes. I'm feeling really great now. I mean, I'm here with you. We're in front of a fire. I have my dog. I'm going to see my horse. I wrote a book. The book is phenomenal. I'll just say it. You are a writer, Selma Blair. Thank you. It means so much. It's hard enough to write a book. It's, it's hard, harder still to do it when you don't have all your faculties about you every day. It was the kindness of strangers who are no longer strangers, Brittany Bloom and my, my, my book agent at the book group and Julie, um, the space they held for me and helping me and helping me type. I would send on a you know, yellow legal pad and take a picture. Be like, can you type this? And now, of course, now that the book's finished, I, I can read them right just fine. <laughs> mm, suspicious. <laughs> I know. Funny but, how that worked. But we got through it. We got through it. And how do you feel knowing it's about to be out in the universe? I'm thrilled because when I did come out with the MS diagnosis, it really felt freeing. Um, but mostly to see that it helped other people just have a touchstone made me feel really good. It made me feel more useful. Um, I'd always get on myself, oh, you're lazy, you want to sleep, but then when I realized just at least by the act of being as honest as I could, um, it, it did something for other people and that in turn empowered me and you know, it's just a whole thing of we're all in, we're all in this together. Well, it's called Mean Baby. You gotta explain the title. When I was just born, people came over to visit the new Beitner baby, that was my last name. And they ran out of that house. These teenagers, don't go over there. The Beitners have a mean baby. <laughs> and it's stuck. The things you're called, how they become part of your story, whether you mean to or not sometimes. You write in the book about um, some very painful episodes, including um, you wrote about a teacher, an educator, who violated you. And you say, he didn't rape me, but he broke me. He broke me. I loved him. Loved him. Father figure. Having a personal betrayal of someone that loves you be so inconsiderate of your life path really hurt. It hurt me and I miss him still as a friend. Mm -hmm. The person that I had met and, and cared for as a mentor. But It feels to me you were quite courageous. I discovered wonderful things writing the book, like how much I had witnessed of friends and what I'd witnessed and what a gift that was here. And even, you know, how much I loved sharing things with people. But it wasn't until writing this book, and, and there is this mention of a rape, it was something I didn't even think of, because I think there were so many trespasses on my life or things were cloudy with my shame, my such a deep shame of my drinking in the past that I was talking one day to Brittany and I immediately told this after this spring break trip and then and I said but I, I, I won't I'm not gonna write that in the book and she said well maybe you want to and then I thought oh of course I have to so many people have had some similar experiences that you just tuck away because you think people are going to say, what did you do? And why didn't you report? And why didn't you do? Why didn't? I was a kid. I was young. And even now, it's hard to report stuff. It's hard. It's really hard. And so I put it in the book. And I even cringed as I was doing the audio book because I thought, how many more stories do I have like this that I didn't even acknowledge? Because there's so many. And I felt so sad for my body. I felt so sad. It kind of took the book and this process to even make you realize that you, you were a victim. People can take advantage. And, and then you're just too ashamed to say anything. And then you just bury it. And you bury it. You really do. And things do come back later when you're in a safer spot. But you still feel don't say you feel unsafe to say it. But I realize I am safe, and yeah, I am glad it's in the book. It's a big deal to have these things happen, and to hold that shame.
in your cells like it's you. Mm. Like it's all you are, is someone that's not worth helping on the side of the road. That you're worth someone to say. She's nothing. I'll never see her again. She's probably passed out the whole night. <laughs> you know, mm. Well, the body remembers. The body remembers. And I want it to remember some love. I want it to remember this day. I want to remember this pink sweater and this dog and my son. I want to remember. I want to remember all the things that feel good. Yeah. I want other people to, too. Yeah. Don't be so indignant, because we can't all have our ways. Let's move forward and help each other. Sometimes when horrible things happen, people, the shame cycle is so big. And I wanted to say, there is no real room for guilt in moving forward. There isn't. There's not much I feel ashamed of anymore, because it just happened. And I did it, or someone did it to me, and I'm, I'm OK now. But things will keep happening, and I'll keep having to figure out how to rise above. And in some ways, it's that. Um, frame of mind that helped you finally get rid of alcohol and kick alcohol out of your life. How did you finally conquer it? What made the difference for you? It was only self-medicating and it wasn't working anymore and when there was public humiliation and I owned it, it there's no going back. I mean now that I was a mother it just changed everything. I think that's incredibly inspiring. When you've made mistakes you own them and you turn the page, and you smile and go forward. You do what you can to make it right for those affected and yourself. And it's important that you acknowledge, really acknowledge, and, and nothing's gonna help by still beating yourself up. You write in the book, I desperately love a story. We all have one. I carry mine inside me. You carry yours inside you. I can hear mine now in my own voice, strong and clear. What's your story? My story is that people would say to me, and I would roll my eyes when they'd say, don't give up before the miracle, don't d commit suicide, because I really was. I could not picture living long. But I think that my story really is that I am figuring it out now, and I am kind to myself, and I really do, really do have the capability to love. You're not the mean baby. I'm not the mean baby. I mean, we all can be a mean baby sometimes. Well, she needs to come out sometimes. I mean, for sure. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Let's talk about your mom. It struck me that she was extraordinarily complex, glamorous, and beautiful, and dynamic, and also emotionally elusive to you at times, and sometimes cruel. I mean, I still adore my mother. She's the most important. My sisters, we cherish her, adore her. She's on a pedestal. But no, she was not a cuddly 
woman. She was a role model, she was a judge, she was a million things. Um, but her idea of me was not gonna be met with, with what I was, I guess. I find it is so universal that we adore our parent so much, but, it, but it's complicated. I felt how torn you could be about your mom, who you clearly adored and she adored you. And yet there were stories that you reveal in the book that are kind of jaw dropping. It's hard because when you grow up with someone like that, you don't realize because I'm a little like her too. <laughs> you know, so you don't realize how like outlandish some things can seem when someone's kind of eccentric. Yeah. But my son said it to me. Um, I, I told him, you know, my mother, she was so critical by nature. And he's like, like you. And I'm like, oh, I am, but I think you're perfect. He's like, all you do is nag at me. Oh, wow. Like that's my kind of love language, thinking I could pick apart someone to make them better or something. I was really struck by it when you were a little girl. One of the first things you learned is your mom saying, I wasn't sure when I was pregnant with my last baby that I really wanted to have a baby. But you know, in her defense to say, I didn't want you, it wasn't meant to be hateful. She meant it to say, oh, that would have been such a mistake to get rid of you. Thank God I have baby Blair. What was it like to grow up in that house? I felt like dying growing up. I mean, I did. And that's why I feel like I'm such a miracle right now <laughs> that I actually want to live. I want to be here. I want to enjoy this. I was so confused and lost and terrified. I was a terrified baby. And your mom would introduce you as, and this is Blair this is or Blair, Selma. Blair, Selma, you both, I went by both. This is Selma, this is the manic depressive. I have never been diagnosed with mania or de depression tons. <laughs> That's mania a label enough. to put on a little kid. But you know, it was dramatic. I think she meant it as a badge of honor. Like, I don't suffer fools. Like, we got real problems here. My kid, my kid's very grounded. She's very deep and disturbed. You know, I think that she felt it out of gravity. Why were you so scared as a little girl? Who wouldn't be? Look at where we are. It's so weird. <laughs> and then you know you're gonna die one day and your mother's gonna die and your sisters. I mean, it's terrifying to be a child and so readily be able to explore uh, the scarier things in life. It was a preoccupation. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that drinking uh, probably really cemented that mm -hmm. um, feeling in me. You started, you had your first drink when you were a little girl, seven years old. Yeah, my first drunk when I was seven. I had my first drinks, you know, much younger. Can you tell me about that? I thought it was God, it was at Passover Seder's. Uh, that I had my first drinks and I always thought that was God. And then when I realized it wasn't, I was like, how convenient. <laughs> it's in a bottle. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's even as a little kid, you're like, that's a comfort. So you started at seven, you drank through elementary school, middle school, high school, college. college. How did you do it? I mean, how did you function? I don't know how I did it. I do, it all makes sense why I was so exhausted. But it was, it was hard. I, I don't know, but maybe it was easier. Maybe I would have never survived without a drink. How did it relieve your pain and your fears? Transitions have always been hard for me and the MS made that very evident. Um, so the drinking would, it, it made me feel warm and comfortable and part of people in this earth. You had a lot of physical ailments since you were a little girl. I mean, you tell the story about telling your mom your leg hurt. She's like, cut it out, Selma. You're old. I mean, I was made fun of my whole life for that leg. You and I'm like, this, <laughs> and it was, this leg? It this was leg that I leg. can't feel? Yeah, it was. And you had a fever for three years. I did, it was a big deal. I mean, doctors thought I had leukemia. We didn't know I didn't, I didn't. But it was, I had a constant high fever. I had so many things that were so indicative of MS growing and optical neuritis young and losing my vision for good. Do you feel, when you look at those physical ailments as a child, do you think, have you ever been told, that probably was the beginning of MS, or that oh, somehow absolutely. connected? Absolutely, the ailments as a kid connected. I don't know if I really did have juvenile MS at like six, when we noticed my eye was first going, or movements, but I do know for sure I had it by the age of 23. And it was definitely there for so long. And the pain is still there. I'm in remission. I built no new lesions, but I still have the, you know, some brain damage and things that are there, but I'm okay with it. It's, 
I'm okay. I'm grateful because I'm doing so much better. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Let's talk about your MS diagnosis. How do you feel about the fact that it took so long to get a proper diagnosis? It never occurred to me. Never occurred to me to have a neurological illness. It was the onset of MS, which is just a symptom of a really unhealthy immune system. I thought I had a million things that weren't what they were, and I would have been a lot kinder to myself if I didn't feel the need to self-medicate or check out or get through. I mean, I wasn't always checking out. I was really trying to be as capable as I could be, and I had no idea, and I was really cruel to myself. I treated myself like garbage. And the medical community sometimes was saying, maybe it's in your mind. It's like, oh, you're fine, you're dramatic, you're talkative, you're... But I would say, I am so tired, I can't move, and this, is hap this has been going on for 20 years. Even that doctor that diagnosed me, he was saying this might be functional, emotional, what traumas happen. And I fell asleep in his office, and he said to my boyfriend at the time, what's she doing? And he's like, oh, she falls asleep everywhere. And he's like, oh, wait, stand up. Put your arms out, shut your eyes. I fell over, like had no idea of proprioception. I didn't know I had proprioception issues. I didn't know that my vision was a hallway. Because if you've had it your whole life, you just think that's how everyone is. It was, the, it was mind blowing to realize there was a diagnosis for this and that other people have it and don't know. And I don't mean to be tough on the doctors, but you really, you really gotta do better for the women. You have to do better for all of us in diagnosing these things. You didn't have to come out publicly. You didn't have to share your journey. Why did you make that choice? I hadn't worked for years because I had been so sick and I, it was kind of flaring because, worse because I was going back to work. I was getting on planes, the planes make it worse. I was falling apart in airports. I couldn't get out of the fetal position or else my body would spasm. And I was getting vertigo all the time. And the doctor even said, with the best intentions, don't tell people. Like, just don't, we're gonna get this under control. But because I had such a bad reaction to the first treatment, it made it so much worse. I was really um, having a lot of movement and speech difficulties that were exacerbated by the prednisone. It just kept getting worse as the diagnosis went on. So it was, so the stem cell really helped, but coming out and talking about it, the story would be told anyhow. So I wanted to gain control of that. And I didn't realize how empowering it would be and how empowered I would be to then tell the truth forevermore after that. What did you think when you started seeing the reaction? I was so touched and I felt so thrilled. Oh, this is what it is to just be a human and show up. Mm -hmm. And to think that there's even a moment that I could have com 
comforted someone or given them an option or think about maybe if stem cells right for them. I'm really, really happy to be able to walk into this space of empowerment and realizing I, I am a calm and stable grown up. I'm okay, <laughs> even though I've not always been. You had a big night at the Vanity Fair party. That was your first night coming out since your diagnosis. What did it take to do it and what did it mean to you to be there? I had no idea how much it would mean to show up trying to look my best in a really aggressive flair and that was a real coming out party for me because I know it meant something to other people and certainly to people with more radical disabilities to see an in, you know? Oh right, this world is ours too. We might not see the ramp there on the stage, but there's people coming to use it and I'm gonna be one of them. I remember our moment meeting and I loved you so much, and you were such a girl. You were such a sister to me. And we were in the bathroom, and I felt really nervous, and you really took my hand. I had the cane, I had the dress, but everyone scurried away, as they should, and you stayed. Well, I was overwhelmed that night, and it was hard. I was afraid that I would vomit. That used to happen out of nowhere. And I was afraid I'd trip and ruin the dress. Just really very real things of, oh my God, I'm not in the same body. And I just cried because of gratitude, but also, I don't know if I can get through this night. It was courageous. You wrote that you never practiced the Oscar speech in front of a mirror, that you never really had those leading lady aspirations. No. Why not? I never felt I was, I was the one leading the pack here. I was very comfortable to witness the greats and be a part of it. But I dare say, I, I'd probably chase that leading lady role a little harder now. <laughs> but I didn't have it in me before. I didn't want to. Well, maybe you I didn't will. even want to, but maybe I will one day. Maybe it will be there for me. I mean, I'm improving on all the ways. But consistency is really key on a set and the energy. And certain triggers will make my body do different things. And I'm not embarrassed of it, but I don't want to take people's time. But yet I would like to, I saw it, Christine Applegate, you know, she did the last season of Dead to Me and she was really dealing with a lot of health, major health challenges and watching her do it, that was an inspiration. So it's like, okay, if I were ever be able to go back to work, I'd want it to be incredible. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Hi everybody, good morning, welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. That brings us to the documentary, because the documentary really tells the story. When I watched the documentary, the word that I thought of was fearless. You were fearless. I'm so sorry, I can't talk right now. We're shooting the final days of my life. You showed it all. Yeah. Why did you want to do that? Because what I was going through with MS looked nothing like, I just couldn't find it. Jen Brea, she did a documentary I saw called Unrest. She had like an inflammatory, like there was an encephalitis issue and a very similar to what I was going through. And I thought, I can't believe a woman is showing this and not afraid someone's gonna put her in a straitjacket. And if you say too much, they think you're a mental patient. The doctor would tell me, you're just dehydrated. Everyone gets stressed. 
I was always so afraid of losing credibility. Mm -hmm. And so she gave me permission. That documentary of opening her life made me feel like I had permission to also have that impact for someone. So I've had a mess many years. I had a very late diagnosis. I've had it at least 25 years, at least. So I had nothing. There was any embarrassment I could get over. But if there's someone else that it would move the needle for them to have some agency in their life and to trust themselves, no matter how odd or dramatic or nothing their symptoms might be from day to day. Because this is the stuff I was afraid of. Let's talk about Arthur, that sweet boy. In a way, the documentary was for him. Why did you want him to see this someday? Has he seen it? He has seen it, finally. He went to the premiere. He, he is. He's like, it wasn't that boring. Thanks. He liked it. When I was going to do stem cell, I thought because I felt so physically and emotionally so awful and drained that I did think there's a chance I won't make it. And so I did want that to be to him knowing that if I did go because my body had given out, that I wanted him to know that I really wanted to be here with him. I really wanted to take the, the steps that it took to be here. Because I was really one of those people that was like, no way, even if I have cancer, I'll never do chemo. That's just the worst thing for your body. I had a real feeling about that. And then when I felt the chemo and I felt better, it's like, okay, just let go of what you're thinking and just try and feel better for your son. But yeah, you can die. I thought if anyone would die, it would be me in that moment because I just was so, I was just so tired. Oh. So I did it for him really um, to just say, I, I did want to communicate with you. You're too young to really care now and I don't tell you, but I, I want you to know you're the last, you're the first thing on my mind and the last thing on my mind. You, you fought to still be here. Yeah. And with I'm everything you've really got. Well. I really did. And I know we, we all will come to times where we're gonna have to fight harder than we think. And, and I was supported, I was lucky. What do you hope he sees when he sees you moving through the world? I hope he sees that when you have something that could potentially be a real setback, in time, it might not happen right away, but in time, set yourself up to recover, you know? And I don't want him to feel ashamed or too scared that he can't move forward. I am so grateful that I'm moving forward because I did not want to my whole life. I wanted to figure out how to die with the least pain possible. <laughs> and I don't now. What kind of mom do you think you are? Embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I talk too much to strangers. But I think I am fun. He loves that I'm willing. If he wakes me up in the middle of the night and he can't sleep, it's like, go back to bed. There's things that I see that I was scared of that he doesn't have at all. Mm -hmm. I give him. He does not want the effusive love that I craved from my mother. So he'll have his own memoir mm -hmm. about how I, you know, tried to kiss him too much. But I, I, I give him, I give him tons of space. I can really see him as his own person. But I love, I love that I'm the person he, he comes to, that he trusts the most. You went and saw a psychic or a fortune teller. And this person told you, you're going to be an advocate. It was Tyler Henry. And I was like, is there anything in my future? And he's like, I don't really see you acting. <laughs> and I was like, cut the tapes, guys. <laughs> I want people to think. You know, but I had been really sick for a long time. And he, he did say, I see you being an advocate. I never saw in a million years that I would be an advocate of let's calm, regroup, and figure out how to move forward and I'm here. Your inspiration comes from overcoming, whether it's MS or addiction yeah. or abuse or hardship or it's and overcoming. Been, it's such a relief to give myself permission to say it's okay. No matter what, the guilt doesn't move through. I have to realize that. It's okay to so be light. So it's not that I'm being cocky of yes. saying like, oh, forgive myself for these things, but truthfully, you're not gonna help anyone else until you've forgiven yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
everybody. We've got a jam-packed pop star plus for you. On the show today is the woman behind the voice of Bart Simpson. Of course, Nancy Cartwright shared some memories from over 30 years of The Simpsons. And Brian Baumgartner, who played Kevin Malone on The Office, he spoke to us about why fans love The Office so much. And later, Fran Drescher told us why every human should own a pet. And our buddy Leah Remini revealed what she likes to watch. It might surprise some people. All right, that was a good teaser for you. Let's get to today's first item. It's Nancy Cartwright. She might be the most recognizable voice from The Simpsons because she plays Bart Simpson. She's the voice. She's been behind the naughty and rebellious Bart for 30 years in The Simpsons, and she told us what it's been like to be part of such an iconic show. You know, when I was cast as Bart, it was like, it was such a dream come true for me because I think everybody has a little bit of Bart Simpson in him or her, you know, in them. <laughs> it's true. We all have these personalities. We're, we're, a, we're such, a, a, such a conglomeration of so many personalities. I describe Bart Simpson as being a 10-year-old, school-hating, underachiever, and proud of it. That was the description that I read in the original audition when I went. And I was supposed to go in for Lisa, but I decided I wanted to do Bart. And he just seemed more interesting than an eight-year-old middle child. His description was so much more clear. So I went in and Matt Groening was there and I had an idea in mind and I said, blah, 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 blah. He's like, oh my God, that's him, that's Bart. And I was hired, boom, on the spot. <laughs> Eat my shorts. Eat my shorts. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? I think Bart Simpson's probably got the most catchphrases of anyone. It's, I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? Eat my shorts. Get bent. No way, man. Cowabunga. Whoa, mama. I mean, all these things are like, whoa. <laughs> Score. It's such a hard question to answer about like, what's my favorite? I don't really, it's kind of like asking who's your favorite kid. There's a good handful of episodes that definitely rank up there. Some of my favorites are the musicals. I love the musicals, like Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, you know, that's a really good one. Cause that's that takeoff on Mary Poppins and Sherry Bobbins is so funny and the singing of it is just crazy. You know, if you want to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. If you wish to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. Help us with math and book reports. Might I add, eat my shorts. Bart! Oh, when Bart gets an F, that's the title of it. It's the first show of the second season. And kind of humbly speaking, I guess, modestly speaking, that one, it got a lot of attention. And it takes Bart, it turns him into, from the first 13 that we did the first season, that episode really shows you a level of Bart Simpson that you have never seen before. And he goes into he just gets really, really sad. And he's super sincere about how he tried to study. And he starts to cry because he feels like he's gonna flunk the fourth grade. And um, that that stands out in my mind. What's the matter? <laughs> well, I would think you'd be used to failing by now. No, no, you don't understand. I really tried this time. I mean, I really tried. Early on in the show, um, it was made very clear to us that, that the actors are not the stars of the show, that the characters are the stars of the show, and I, nobody had any problem with that. I don't think anybody had any idea that the show was gonna go on, you know, 33 plus years and, and turn into the icon that it is. But we instead were all like armpit to armpit, elbow to elbow in one little tiny booth that was not meant for recording in. So we had like moving carpets up on the walls because they were, one big wall was all glass and when we spoke it would vibrate so they had to put a carpet in front of it and we would all share the same microphone, armpit check, you know. Uh, um, and here I am very pregnant. It was a lot of um, give and take from from all of us actors. But it was, I, I look at that and like, that is such a 
such a humble, modest beginning for what came to be, you know, it's pretty cool. When I meet fans, it's like, it's, it's pretty cool because most of the time I'm not recognized. Most of the time, I'm just this anonymous celebrity, and it doesn't matter where I am. Nobody, because I don't look like him. My skin's not yellow, nine spikes. I'm not a 10-year-old boy. But I can have more causation over revealing who I really am. And so if it's just a spontaneous thing, and I'm talking to somebody, and I ask them, so what's your name? And they say, oh, my name's Katie. And I'll say, oh, well, hi, Katie. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? And and it is just like the jaw drops to the ground and it, it's equally fun for me it still is to this day i love surprising people and it's kind of a cool thing it sometimes pops people out of their funk and isn't that kind of what we need right now we need some kind of enlightenment we need some humor some lightness some aesthetics one question that people like to ask me is why is The Simpsons so successful? How has it lasted this this long? And I think it just, it, it actually doesn't even matter what, this is funny to say this, what decade you look at, because we're, <laughs> we're in our third decade, that's crazy. But no matter what decade you look at, The Simpsons has a consistency in the, the business model, in you know, the way that it's done. It's got this family that has its own kind of rules or or lack of uh, lack of rules and they're kind of a nice quote unquote normal family and i do think they represent a lot of people that can say wow that's us you know whether it's the simpsons or all the citizens of springfield it's like people can find things that they can relate to and that has been such a success and the tip of the hat to the writers and the executives on the show Thanks to Nancy for sharing all those memories with us. Next up, we're revisiting the Dunder Mifflin Paper Company with the Office star, Brian Baumgartner. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. We have Scranton, Pennsylvania on the mind for this next flashback interview. Hard to believe it's been 17 years since the premiere of The Office the hit TV show about the work lives of paper company employees. Brian Baumgartner played the lovable Kevin Malone and weighed in on why he thinks people still love the show so much. At least once a year, I like to bring in some of my Kevin's famous chili. At least once a year, I like to bring in some of my Kevin's famous chili. I, I want to eat a pig in a blanket. In a blanket. Nope, it's not Ashton Kutcher. It's Kevin Malone. Equally handsome, equally smart. Well, Kevin Malone, <laughs> how would I describe Kevin Malone? Uh, I think Kevin Malone is a, a man of uh, some unique skills. Um, who uh, is is misunderstood in a way? His childlike sensibility fits into the rest of the ensemble of the office. 
um, very well. I had such a blast playing him and, and continue to be delighted by, by how fans re react to him. I do think that of all of the other actors and, and, and characters uh, on The Office, I do think that, that probably I'm the most dissimilar uh, to mine. My Kleenex shoes were a huge conversation piece, but man, my dogs are barking. But, you know, look, I loved, I, I loved his ability um, to be in the moment. I used to say he has no memory of what happened before or any ramifications for what might happen uh, in the future. But in the moment, he uh, if he enjoyed a moment, he was willing to show it. Um, often didn't think too far ahead, but I had uh, I had a blast playing with him. And, and you know, our little... Uh, our little group in the corner, the accountants, Oscar and Angela and Kevin, I, I describe it as, as kind of a perfect comedy triangle. Well, I need to give my cat up for adoption. Mm. The one who uses the doorbell or the one with the Mexican hat or the one with the rain galoshes or the one that you let go around naked. Which had nothing to do with us, which had to do with the, the writers and the construction of the characters. But um, the way that the alliances kept shifting, their specific personalities and how they played off of each other uh, was so much fun to do for, for almost a decade. I think for me now, my favorite episode would have to be Stress Relief. Um, otherwise known as uh, the Dwight's fake fire drill. Oh, here's a door. Check that one out. How's the handle? And it's warm. Okay, go to the back well, door. Well, uh, another option. Another yeah, option. Jeez. Okay, settle down, everyone. And I think, you know, for me now, um, there's so many great episodes but I, I think for me what was happening outside of the show uh carries special significance for me as well so i think it's a hilariously funny well-written episode i saw a friend today it had been a while we forgot each other's name a lot of things spring to mind thinking about the finale I basically shot the show my 30s. My whole 30s was dedicated to being together, which is, is high school and college, and then two more years, uh, spending a lot of time with those people. So, you know, it was really knowing that whatever happened, the, the friendships would be there, um, the relationships would, would remain, but we wouldn't be spending 60 to 70 hours a week together anymore. And that, that was gonna be a, a huge change. Uh, for us, so uh, a huge feeling of loss, uh, but also tremendously proud of the journey that we had and the fact that we chose to end it. We had a story that we wanted to tell and we made sure that, that we got that story in uh, and told it you know, largely with, with the original people who were, were cast. I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone who was on the show could have ever guessed that the show would end up doing um, becoming what it has become today. I mean, we were we were almost we almost made a pilot and was never on the air. And then, you know, the fact that that an audience picked up on it. I always knew what we were doing was special. If people gave it a chance, I just thought, well, people aren't going to give it a chance. So um, I'm I'm tremendously uh, proud of the show. As I say to people, I'm I'm a fan of the show and and and, and love watching it. And, and I'm so proud to have been a part of it. You know, in, in examining through this book that I have coming out, Welcome to Dunder Mifflin, you know, one of the things that we are looking at is why the show has not just survived, but has thrived eight years after we have filmed any anything. And I think that it's really about the people. Uh, it's really about the construction of, of, of the idea and the aesthetic of the show that was so really revolutionary and groundbreaking at the time, but the hiring of the specific actors to play the roles and the writing staff that was brought in, which are now the top comedy writers in television today. You know, it was just a, a special and unique collection of people uh, led by Greg Daniels, who, you know, created the show um, and uh, and his genius in, in in finding the perfect people for their job. That's really why I think. What a classic. We love that show in our house. Hope you enjoyed that one. Office fans, it was for you. Coming up, 
We've got nanny star Fran Drescher sharing the key to easing her anxiety. It happens to be her furry friend. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Did you know that Fran Drescher is a huge, huge dog lover? She's even had a famous dog of her own. Get this, Chester, that's the dog on the nanny, was actually Fran's real-life dog. She told us all about that and how her pets have shaped her life in this episode of our series, My Pet Tale. I start on the nanny, and I wrote a part for my first dog ever, Chester Drescher. Oh, Chester, I haven't seen you in such a long time. Nanny Fine, please, he doesn't like strangers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chester was an amazing dog because he was extremely consistent in his behavior. We knew what he would do under certain circumstances. So we wrote towards that. And that was why every time, you know, Cece Babcock grabbed him away from me, we knew that he would growl. Oh, how thoughtful. <laughs> so we always had her do that. You need some time to get used to you. I mean, you can't expect a dog to just jump into your arms and love you at first sight. Mr. Sheffield. Oh, you got a real puppy. Oh, how sweet. Oh, look how friendly. And it was great working with him because he was always on the set anyway. I'm always of the camp, must love dogs. I have a, a dog now, uh, Angel Grace, and I rescued her just days before lockdown. And then she rescued me. And for the first couple of months of our relationship at my house, you know, it was just her and me. I don't think she really uh, knew what was happening. <laughs> But all of a sudden, you know, it was just the two of us for a couple of months. And so it really did bond us. And we're very, very close now. And she's three years old and I travel with her and she's my service animal. So I'm just very grateful to have the first big dog I've ever had. And, you know, she uh, gives me added security and, uh, and helps me through situations that sometimes would otherwise uh, make me anxious. She's kind of different shades of white and bone, and I thought she was so loving when I met her at the rescue place, and so sweet uh, that uh, I said, you know, are you an angel? Did Samson send you to me? And Samson was the dog that sadly 
uh, had died just days earlier uh, from a stroke. I said, are you an angel? Is that your name? And it just seemed suitable to her because she is such an angel. She is definitely a big part of the family. She's got all these other mothers who come and take care of her if I have to go out of town and I can't take her with me. Dog is God spelled backwards, and I think that dogs are here to teach us unconditional love, to remind us that there's room in our hearts to love another, even if you've loved and lost. And I think that every human should experience unconditional love. It's just a, a bond between two species that really is unparalleled. I just, you know, couldn't live without having a canine to love and care for and feel loved by and share my bed with. Just be there as a friend and a companion and company, a wonderful company. In fact, as a cancer survivor, you know, I always tell other people recently diagnosed, make sure your pet sleeps in the bed with you because at night is when your imagination and fear starts to run wild because you don't have the distractions of the day. And if you don't have a pet, get one. Well, it's really nice to hear people's pet stories. They mean so much. All right, still to come, Leah Remini breaks down her must-watch list. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped playing, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And welcome back. We absolutely love learning more about our friend Leah Remini. When she can't fall asleep, she turns to one particular show, and it just might surprise you. She spoke to us for our What I Watch series. When I have to fall asleep, when I can't fall asleep, I put on forensic files. Don't know why, listening to stories, people being murdered, gets me to sleep. That's probably, I mean, a psychologist would probably have an answer. It was a delivery he never expected. The older version of Forensic Files, the guy's voice, it's so soothing. And he's like, and then they found her decapitated. Something about the guy's voice. I don't know what it is. What I watch when I need comfort food is a reality show. Pick any one, Housewives of any state, or I watch A Love Island, or I watch Below Deck, basically Bravo. What I love about reality shows in general is that I just feel like it takes me away, like it's a mind vacation. I. I, I find myself not multitasking in my brain, like when I'm watching something um, that's you know newsworthy, I start to think about all the things I need to do in my life, things I'm not doing right. Um, I think I should be a better daughter, a better mother, a better this, a better aunt, a better sister, you know. 
But when I watch reality shows, it's almost like my mind is suspended. It is literally frozen. And I mean, I the picture of, I get of myself while I'm watching reality shows is just kind of drool. Kind of, it isn't, but I, like, that's what I picture myself doing because it's so mind numbing. My daughter Sophia got me onto Love Island, but only UK versions. Like, she, you know, we find that to be li- the better versions of, of, of Love Island. <laughs> it's a little riskier. Um, so I, I really tend to, to go to those or like I'll watch a marathon of like Say Yes to the Dress. It's the not having to think about changing the channel or, you know, so it's usually if I see there's five, six, seven, eight seasons of something, I'm in because then somehow I like fall asleep and then I'm like, wait, well, how'd I get on season four? And it's just anything that has multiple seasons. What I watch that might surprise people, I don't know that what I watch might surprise people. I do watch a lot of documentaries. I don't know that that's surprising to people, but when people talk about documentaries, they're like, you probably haven't seen this. I'm like, seen it. Like, I'll watch a documentary on uh, flies. Like, I just love documentaries. It doesn't really matter what it is. I just love uh, real stories. Sitting here in traffic on the Queensboro Bridge tonight. I didn't need to prepare for the King of Queens because I am Carrie. Um, there's no need for me to prep. Oh, she's a girl from Brooklyn married to a neighborhood guy who has a crazy father in her basement. Like there was nothing I needed to prep for. I knew the character. I know the character very well. But you know what's funny about the King of Queens is that I remember um, our producers, when I first got the role, we did a pilot and our executive producer was like, you know, why do you, why are you wearing makeup? And I was like, first of all, have you been to a borough in New York? Like, you know what I mean? Like Queens, Brooklyn, what do, like the idea of what a borough, per, like, was like, they don't get their nails done. They don't wear makeup. And I was like, first of all, everything from a borough, like I'm from Bensonhurst. Don't tell me, like, I didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my stuff was coordinated. You know, like my outfits were matching the shirt, you know, back in my day, it was matching your shirt with your socks and like everything was color coordinated. So like the idea of what somebody from New York is like was so off that I was like, no, no, I, this girl gets her nails done. This girl gets her hair done. This girl, like, cause this girl is me. So we're not doing sweatpants and, and I go, and by the way, if we wear sweatpants, it's color coordinated. What, what I watched when I did a good cry. Oh my God. Terms of endearment. Um, the notebook. Steel Magnolias. It's about friendships. It's about family. It's about um, losing people that you love. I mean, it's just, and the notebook just like, just kills me. It just, every time. There's not a time. And then um, Moulin Rouge. I know that sounds crazy, but I cry every time. Every time she dies. Every time. I've seen it. 56 times, probably just in the last year. It's a wonderful life. Every holiday, crying. Every time, every time. What I watch with my family is anything my daughter wants to watch. It's not um, done by votes or even what her parents would want to watch because as they get older, They have their own rooms, they have their own computers, they can watch whatever they want to watch. So if my daughter says, I want to watch such and such with you guys, I'm like, K, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Whatever she wants to watch, I'm like, I will watch. Thanks to Leah for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. Well, there you have it. That was today's Popstar Plus. Thanks for being here and join us again tomorrow. We'll see you then. Bye.
Oh my gosh, look. People are watching today all day, uh, today in 30. We hope you had a great weekend. Oh, we do. We've got a lot to get to here on the digital show, including the ongoing search for answers after another weekend of gun violence across the country. We'll have the latest on it and also tell you where a potential deal on gun reform now stands on Capitol Hill. Also, Ed, we're taking you inside the finale of the Queen's Jubilee from the star-studded tributes to Her Majesty's surprise appearance. We'll have a full report from Windsor Castle straight ahead. And then we've got not one, but two cast reunions to share with you. The first with the hilarious cast of Scrubs, more than a decade after they filmed the finale, and then break out the tissues. The cast and creators of Parenthood <laughs> <laughs> met up to talk about their favorite moments from that beloved series. So stick around because it's all coming back right now on Today, Today in 30. 30. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is in Philly with the very latest this morning. Gabe, good morning. Savannah, good morning. It was chaos here. There were hundreds of people on this street when the gunshots rang out. And the victims range in age from 17 to 69 years old. And as you mentioned, this was one of many shootings across the country over the weekend as lawmakers now push for new gun legislation. This morning, newly released video captures the moment gunshots rang out in Philadelphia. The massive crowd seen fleeing a popular nightlife area Saturday night as gunfire kills three people and leaves 11 others wounded. Horrendous and unthinkable acts happened. Just hours later in Chattanooga, Tennessee, police say 12 more people were injured and two others killed by gunfire at a nightclub. There's going to be multiple shooters. We cannot confirm how many, but there's definitely uh, more than one. The back-to-back -back deadly shootings capping a weekend of gun violence across the nation. Since Friday, there have been 13 mass shootings across the country, according to the Gun Violence Archive, which defines mass shootings as four or more shot, not including the shooter. On Saturday, eight injured and one dead in Phoenix. And in Somerton, South Carolina, one person was killed and seven others injured, including five minors. I am furious, not just for my neighborhood, for the whole country. It all comes less than two weeks after a lone gunman killed 19 children and two teachers at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. He looks right back at me and with, this, with that evil look, and I see this rifle. Cody Briseño tells NBC News he locked eyes with the shooter moments before the gunman began his rampage inside the school. I feel guilty, man, because I, mean, I couldn't stop him. The immense pain felt in Uvalde, Buffalo, Tulsa, and a growing number of other communities has heightened pressure on Congress, as top lawmakers say they hope to present a bipartisan gun reform package by the end of the week. Some on both sides are cautiously optimistic. It feels to me like we are closer than we've been since I've been in the Senate. It's a test of the federal government as to whether we can deliver at a moment of just fierce anxiety amongst the American public. So mm -hmm. we're closer than ever before. And on Wednesday, victims, relatives, and survivors from both Buffalo and Uvalde are set to testify before Congress. And just this morning, act, act, actor Matthew McConaughey, who was born in Uvalde, is out with a new op-ed calling for changes that he says will prevent gun violence, including raising the age limit to buy assault rifles to 21 and instituting a national waiting period for assault rifle purchases, Savannah. And Gabe, do, do police in Philly have any more information about what sparked this shooting? Well, certainly, Savannah, they're looking into this right now. But right now, what they think is that one of the men who died had apparently gotten into a fight with another man. Both of them opened fire, and that's when multiple people started shooting. Investigators believe possibly as many as five. But so far, Savannah, no arrests. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job 
is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Going out of the celebrations for the Queen, four days of Platinum Jubilee festivities wrapped up yesterday after a weekend of star-studded events, including a surprise appearance by the guest of honor herself. NBC's Kelly Cobiello was there. She joins us now from Windsor Castle. Hey, Kelly, good morning. Good morning to you both. Yes, the Queen is also back here in Windsor, inside Windsor Castle, her home. And yesterday, on the final day of the Jubilee, she actually thanked the public. She said she was humbled and deeply touched that so many people came out to celebrate. And she gave them that one last reason to cheer. A royal surprise on the last day of Jubilee celebrations, the Queen appearing on the palace balcony giving delighted crowds the cherished moment they were waiting for. God save the Queen! The 96-year-old monarch beaming, looking vibrant in bright green, joined by three generations of royals thanking the country. My heart has been with you all, and I remain committed to serving you to the best of my ability, supported by my family. Leading Sunday's parade, a hologram of the young queen waving to the crowds, beamed onto the historic carriage she rode for her coronation 70 years ago. Yes, please. The real Queen Elizabeth showed off her acting skills, kicking off Saturday's concert with another British icon, the famous Paddington Bear. Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. The Queen's family taking center stage, including Prince William and Kate's three children, usually kept away from the cameras, but over the weekend, they were the stars. And in light. Prince Charles leading the tributes, adding personal touches in a heartfelt speech. Your Majesty, Mummy, <laughs> we all say thank you. With a nod to the Queen's late husband, Prince Philip. My papa would have enjoyed the show and joined us wholeheartedly. Tens of thousands danced shoulder to shoulder in front of Buckingham Palace Saturday night to musical legends Rod Stewart, Elton John, Diana Ross. Prince William and Kate's oldest son, eight-year-old Prince George, loving the show. Kate sharing a video as the family baked cupcakes in Wales. The real royal show stealer was William and Kate's youngest son, four-year-old Louis, making faces, chatting with his great-grandmother, the Queen, hugging and challenging mom, Kate, sitting on Grandpa Charles's lap. Prince Harry and Meghan keeping a low profile, making only one public appearance at Friday's church service, spending most of their time privately, while the rest of the family and country celebrated their queen. And Kelly, uh, Louis was, was cute, uh, but he was more than just cute. Louis, Charlotte, and George, they were actually out doing some <laughs> royal work. Is that right? That's right. Well, Princess uh, Charlotte and Prince George both went with their parents to a royal engagement over the weekend in Wales. They got a behind-the-scenes look of a, at a concert that was going to be performed there for the Jubilee. They shook hands with members of the public, really getting an introduction into what their life is going to be like. And the Cambridges shared that video on their social media, so really putting them forward, sort of easing them into the spotlight. Meantime, the Queen's other great-grandchildren, Prince Harry, and Meghan's children, Archie and Lilibet, they weren't seen in public at all on this trip. And actually, the Daily Mail is reporting today that the Sussexes left England before the celebrations were over yesterday. NBC News has reached out, but we haven't yet heard back. Guys. All right. Kelly Cobiella for us. Kelly, thank you so much. I'm George, in love with Louis. Louis. I was going to say, George and Charlotte were invited to participate in that. Louis was left behind no, no. after his performance earlier. Incredible. Yeah.
about a little morning boost. All right, so Lost and Found Day at a Jersey high school was supposedly a chance to reunite students with things like sweatshirts they forgot or lunch boxes they lost, but it was actually a setup so one teacher could be reunited with her soldier son. What does this belong to? U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Jake Plesh had not seen his mom, the school teacher, in more than a year. When he found out that he'd be heading home from Iraq, he called his sister, who got to school, to organize this special surprise. Wow. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning, welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel calm? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can't do this all We're back. Oh, Gotti Schwartz has joined the party. Um, Gotti, so because that binge watching jackpot over the weekend, you were in Austin, Texas, some beloved cast back together, including the gang from Scrubs. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Tough assignment. Over 100 yeah. episodes just streamed all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How was it? It was fantastic. <laughs> it holds up. And I don't know about you guys, but everybody I know says that when it comes to the medical profession, Scrubs uh, is the hands down most accurate. It's not Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> uh, it's not General Hospital. It is Scrubs. So uh, we got a chance to sit down with the cast at the ATX TV Festival this weekend and ask the cast about that. And let's just say they left us in stitches. I can't do this all on my own. It's been a decade since the cast of Scrubs walked the halls of Sacred Heart, but some things never change. What's it like being back together for the festival? I hate these people. <laughs> <laughs> Casts from all over television appeared at the ATX TV Festival in Austin, but probably none had as much fun as the cast of Scrubs reuniting. Walking down the streets of Austin uh, as a group for dinner, and having people that were just going out to have a night do double takes and go, you from Scrubs? Yeah, we changed the drinks uh, on the way home for dinner because there were so many drunk people that it was, be it was becoming hard to get home. <laughs> and just like that, the crack medical team that saved lives and dreamed big was back at it again with raunchy jokes. One day I had just a leaf, literally a leaf, a maple leaf covering my junk, and that was it. And secret noises. There was a specific noise we could make. <laughs> <laughs> that noise. And Sarah would always start laughing. A marvel to think this was the show that inspired a generation of new doctors and nurses. Of all of the medical shows, this is what universally doctors and nurses say was the most accurate. I think that's such a testament to Bill because he always said, 
We're going to be very silly sometimes, but I always want the medicine to be completely accurate. The series, which debuted in 2001 here on NBC, followed JD, Turk, Elliot, Dr. Cox, and Carla for nine seasons. Oh, Turk, that's a stupid sitcom. <gasps> I mean, that's a sitcom. Full of slapstick dream sequences. Pretty sneaky death. And tender moments of compassion, dealing with death like no other show had done before. But with dialysis, you could live another 80 or 90 years. I think you're being a little irrational. Zach Braff and Donald Faison have gone on to become real life best friends. <laughs> Listen, man, I mean, I found my life partner while making this show, man. It's like... I, a, by the way, this should be on the yeah, Today exactly, Show. Exactly. Your he wife's going to watch wife, this. Oh, my wife is watching? <laughs> <laughs> I found my life partner, Casey Cobb, <laughs> while making Scrubs. I got to ask about the dream sequences. I mean, what was the most expensive dream sequence you ever came up with? I wanted Zach to be riding a scooter and I wanted him to go in a puddle and go underwater completely. The line producer came into the writer's room and he goes, this joke's gonna cost $75,000. <laughs> He's like, you sure you wanna do it? Where was I? You saw a manatee down there, right? Yes, his Julian. name was Julian. Julian. Yes. We didn't exchange pleasantries and then Neil says, that's Julian. So much of the script written on site or improvised, including one of the best on-screen dance-offs of all time, Poison. It's not happening, bro. A little bit? No. It's not happening, no. I love that song. The dance so popular, it's been immortalized by the video game Fortnite. My son looked at me and he said, Dad, this makes you an even bigger legend. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. But when it came to Dr. Cox and those epic rants, he was on book. Days granted to you, five days may seem like an eternity, seems as it's roughly five times as long as any of your white pasty relationships have lasted. I would hand John these giant page-long monologues, and I'd be like, you got to do this word for word in about 45 minutes. <laughs> I decided if I was going to memorize this, I was not going to give you a cut point. You're going to damn sure stay on me the whole time. You made me shave my mustache. That was before I knew what was under there. It just feels like it was yesterday for yeah. me and through TikTok. My kid has become hip to the show. It was the best job in the world because you knew you were going to belly laugh several times a day. We would all eat lunch together at the lunch tent, and the writers would all come too, and we'd hang out with them, or we'd go down to the writers' room and hang out. I don't think I'll ever experience what we had on this show again. You yeah, gotta go back and watch yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, biggest impression that I got from every single one of them is this immense gratitude towards their fans and this real love that they had uh, towards each other. So the natural question, could we see an yeah. on-screen reunion? Well, the cast said they'd love to, but Bill Lawrence is too busy uh, these days with projects like Ted Lasso. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Bill yeah, shot did. back saying, let's do it. So oh. stay tuned. We oh. could see a Scrubs movie. Oh, oh movie. Wow. something to Peacock. Very cool. So, so, good. Good. Wow. so ahead of its time. Too I know. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh. And a lot of that stuff, they could, probably couldn't do half those jokes. That is, yeah. <laughs> we got more reunions yeah. coming up. Third hour. Yeah. Yeah. Parenthood. Parenthood's coming up yes. next. Yeah. yeah, yeah next. NBC. Right. Thank, Thank you, got you got it. Sure. The cast of NBC's Parenthood came together this weekend at the ATX TV Festival in Austin. And NBC's Gotti Schwartz caught up with him. You had a busy weekend. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was very, very emotional. Uh, I know it's barely 9 a.m., but get ready to get out some tissues because the cast and creator of Parenthood got back together this weekend. And I got a chance to sit down with them and talk to them about some of their favorite Braverman family TV moments. <laughs> There's never been a show like this. Whenever I see you guys, it's like we just picked up where we left off. It's a long-awaited Braverman family reunion. The cast of Parenthood and the viewers who love it shined in Austin this weekend for the ATX TV Festival. The thing is, Max, we're part of the family. You know, family's the most important thing in our lives. You guys are still a family. Yeah, sure. We should play the song now. <laughs> <laughs> For six seasons, fans followed the Bravermans through their ups and downs, led by patriarch Zeke. Do you know what I thought about? What I dreamt about? I dreamt you, Amber. And the families of his four children. 
do. I'm gonna ask you to trust me, okay? We got to look at them as one big, you know, family together, but we got to watch each of them and see how they all had their own kind of struggles and challenges. What if you had died? I get it. The show depicting real family issues and opening doors for conversations on topics like autism. Are you mad at me because I have Asperger's? I'm, I'm not mad at you because you have Asperger's. Never. Then there was Christina Braverman's breast cancer that rocked the family to its core. The one that brought me to tears, like uncontrollable tears, was when you left a message for your family if you were to pass. I have the chills right now, yeah. That was the hardest one for sure. I may not always be with you the way that I want to be. But I will never leave your side. One storyline of Julia Braverman still vivid for actress Erica Christensen 10 years later. When she found out she couldn't have the baby. That, that was that was like the moment. That was mm. the worst. For Jason Kadens, much of the show can be defined by one scene that speaks to the very core of parenthood. In the pilot episode, when Peter Krause's character says to his dad, yes. Dad, there's something wrong with my son. It was a very scary thing for me to write that scene. And I'm going to need you to help me. Jason created a world that was both realistic and aspirational. Mm. And so I think the idea of real families with real issues and real struggles, but at the end of the day, they would find the love would bring them back together. And of course, there were the unforgettable dance parties and the kinds of weddings only the Bravermans could throw. My favorite scene was like the wedding because like when <laughs> it wasn't the, the making no, out with Dax I mean, like notebook cool. style. I, mean, like, <laughs> I just think like overall for me the, the entire experience of working on a show. I mean still the greatest job I've ever had. I mean I mean that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Real talk. It was almost as though you could see your family's messiness reflected in this family. As much as the characters were informed by our lives, like we could also learn from the characters. It's hope, it's love. It's laughter crying, it's, 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 it's humanity. Oh. Such an incredible cast of an incredible show and a fun piece of Parenthood trivia. Uh, those famous dance parties yeah. that you saw there, they were all shot in silence. Wow. So everyone was doing That's their own funny. thing. Yeah, wow. and it was completely silent on the set. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, you got, <laughs> you got those dance parties. And then they put the musical, That's funny. And uh -huh. you can still stream that show, right? You can stream it on Peacock. Okay. Absolutely. And it holds up. holds up. I'll yeah. tell you, it holds up even even better now. I, I just had a baby, or my wife had a baby. Well, yeah, you're new, in and a new so place in I life. I did not understand any of this ah, parenthood yeah. situation, and then all of a sudden, I'm like crying yep. every time I watch home. these episodes. Like pre, this is us. That was Daddy, great. thank you. That show you. was so well written. Too. Yeah, it was. Like perfectly cast. Good. They should bring that back. If it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Well, many Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Yeah, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. 
If you spent the weekend unplugged away from the news, you might have missed some very hot topics, but we're going to fill you in. Yeah, here to catch us all up with the scoop is New York Live entertainment correspondent Joelle Gargiulo. Gar Joelle. We did not know half of this stuff. Well, oh, great. Then I'm happy to be here. Okay, I'm happy MTV to be here. We didn't even know it was awards. on. Okay. I'm dying. Yes, Tell MTV us. Movie and TV Awards were last night. It was a great show. In case you missed it, here are some highlights. Okay. Vanessa Hudgens, she was the host. Props to all the outfit changes. Wow. Okay, she was joined on stage by Snoop Dogg wow. using his DJ persona known as DJ Snoopadelic. <laughs> I love Snoop. More Snoop all the time. Jack Black was honored with the Comedic Genius Award. His entrance was <laughs> awesome. He did <laughs> this like leap into a somersault what? right there. There oh. you go. My knees hurt just watching that. He should get an award for getting up so quickly. But I think the highlight of the night came from Hoda's girl. I love that we could just say oh, yes. J-Lo. So she received the Generation Award, but she gave this speech that just like, I was texting with Sean, one of our producers. We were like, this is amazing. We have to show it. So here's a little okay. clip. I want to thank the people who gave me joy and the ones who broke my heart. The ones who were true and the ones who lied to me. I want to thank true love and I want to thank the way that I lied to myself because that's how I knew that I had to grow. I want to thank disappointment and failure for teaching me to be strong and my children for teaching me to love. So we wow. know. I mean, is that incredible? That so, was awesome. Yeah, wow. we couldn't show you the whole thing, but at the end, she just says, and to Ben and everybody at home, right? I, like, we love it when she addresses yeah. Ben. Yeah. Um, and she was like, wait up for me for dinner. So here's what we oh. need to plot, because what? I know you're going to see J-Lo on Wednesday. Yeah. Hoda needs an invitation to that wedding. <gasps> what gonna, wedding? To they're their not, wedding. But they're not engaged. They're not, they're not, they haven't asked their date yet, have they? No. No, okay. but so that's like my new mission. So I'm going to interview her on Wednesday. We're getting you an invite to that, right? Do that. We need that. We need that. Do that. If you can I do that, you, you can do anything. I think you should be invited. J-Lo, help your girl out, you okay? You know, All right? Okay. okay, so we have more award shows okay. to talk about. Go, the Tonys. Okay, what? yeah, so the 75th Annual Tony Awards are going to be on Sunday. This is going to be huge. So it's been two years of, of pretty much torture yeah. for the Broadway industry. So yeah. think about this as, like, a front row seat to Broadway's greatest comeback. Tell us what's good. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I mean, everything's good. I'm going to start with some of the categories because it's yeah. like packed with star yeah. power this year. So best actor in a musical, you have got Billy Crystal for Mr. Saturday mm, Night. Wow. Up against Hugh Jackman Hugh for Jackman. The Music Man. I've no, seen but, him in that. The oh, Music Man was incredible. It's incredible. He was incredible. But then also you have newcomers, Miles Frost, this yes. is his Broadway debut. He plays Michael Jackson in MJ, oh, the musical. Oh, I heard he's incredible. Insane. And then Jaquel Spivey, he's in A Strange Loop. This is the show that everyone's talking yeah. about. Rob McClure also rounds out that for Mrs. Doubtfire. He was great. It could go to anybody, and you'd okay. be like, okay, great, By they the way, deserve it. You're right about the Tonys, the perfect yes. way to watch all, all the Broadway the shows. shows. It's yeah. going to be like performances. Yes. Yes. All right, there uh, were some celebrity breakups. We yes, okay, discuss. yes, celebrity breakups. I, I, I always am just like, can we please just work it out? So we have Shakira. <laughs> so she made an announcement. She is splitting from her longtime partner. They've been together for 12 years. Okay. They have two kids. They released a joint statement. But then also, this one was such a shocker to me. Mm. Um, Michael B. Jordan and Lori Harvey. I know. It what? is being reported that they have split up. So a source told People said Michael matured a lot over the course of their relationship and was ready to commit for the long term. So they haven't said anything about it. But if you go to her Instagram, he is no longer on her oh, social she media. Scrubbed him. She scrubbed him. She scrubbed. I love How about that. His? Like, that's like Does a she have social media. Yeah, she's still so on that's there. Still there. So yeah. she's still on his, but he's no longer <laughs> on her. Oh, what does that yeah. mean? I what don't know. I just I, could you guys get Steve Harvey on the show and and get and get the information? We had him on. We before. had him. I know. And, and we, we did ask. Him, and we pressured. I, I, that was a great. Was moment, it our by fault? The way. No. no. That was a great no. moment. Oh, by the way. Show out. I know. So hopefully they hopefully they work it out because they seem but to be a fantastic. You never know. Yeah. Never know. People can get back people, together. Yeah. People can. Who or knows? they may go. Yeah, they may be happy. We yeah. don't know. Well, that's true. And and people are a little mixed. Like some people are like, yeah, he's single. And well, and what about her? She's gorgeous. She's She's All right, Joe, thank you. And we hope you will be back tomorrow for another big morning right here on Today. Melissa McCarthy's going to be here. Oh, my God, we love her. We can't wait to laugh with her. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great Monday.
gonna make some slices here. Good job. You okay? Welcome to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal. In this Today All Day series, I'm looking back at some of my favorite Cooking with Cal recipes and sharing my top kitchen tips. Today's episode is one that we're calling Grandma's Greatest because it features recipes from two amazing grandmas. First up, you'll see me and Calvin whipping up my mom's pasta salad, and then we tackle my grandmother's short ribs. You know, one of the biggest obstacles timid cooks face in the kitchen is just not knowing where to start or what to make. Well, here's a good rule of thumb. Always cook what you know and what you loved growing up. Just think back to what your parents and grandparents always served. I've also found that family recipes are often the simplest, which is probably why our parents made them so often. This first recipe is proof of that. You only need five ingredients, pasta, canned tomatoes, black olives, parsley, and olive oil. Take a look. Okay. All right, so let's get the ingredients ready. I know this thing works. So we're gonna use a can of tomatoes. But these are cooked tomatoes. They're not raw tomatoes. So you'll like these because they're cooked tomatoes, okay? Now turn that as hard as you can. <clears throat> use those muscles. <clears throat> Do you want some help? Do you know what these are? What? Olives. Black olives. Not on taste one, you haven't tried one in a long time. Ollie loves them. Ollie loves olives. A little bit. I love them. I could do them like this. So we got our tomatoes, our olives. You know what this is? What? Got some parsley. All right, you want to chop this for me? Why don't you put your hand like that? There we go. Good job. Now I'm just gonna make these all a little smaller, okay? This adds a nice pop of green and a nice freshness to the whole dish. So a lot of times my mom would use elbow noodles, the ones that look like C's or U's as you call them. I felt like using tricolor pasta. You know why they call it tricolor pasta? Why? Because there's three colors. So this one is just made with wheat. This one has tomato in it. And what do you think's in this one if it's green? Broccoli. Close. What else is green? What's green and leafy? Celery. Well, celery has some leaves. What looks like lettuce? Spinach. Yay! Cool. I'm gonna dump this in, okay? Well, that's boiling. Can you dump the can of tomatoes in here? Now all of the olives. The parsley. Ah, good call, buddy. Good idea. Now we wait. Can you taste that? Mm. Mm. Perfect. All right, drain the noodle. All right, I want to pour these into this bowl. Dump a whole bunch of olive oil in here. All of it? Not all of it, I'll tell you what. All around, swirl it all around. Salt. This will come out fast, so let's not. Let's give it a big stir. Before we put this in the fridge to let it cool down, let's taste it, okay? Mm -hmm. You like it? it? Tastes even better when it's cold. So I thought this was such an easy recipe, but you guys had a lot of questions about it, so let's get to them. First, what's the last seasoning you put on the salad? Just salt and pepper. I think there's not a lot of seasoning or anything that goes into this salad, so if I sprinkle anything on it, it's, it's really just salt and pepper. I'm a big fan of salt and pepper. Next question, did you drain the tomatoes? Uh, no, I put the whole can with the diced tomatoes and the liquid because some of the pasta absorbs some of that liquid, so um, it, it helps to add some moisture to the dish. Another viewer asked, do you think it would still be tasty without the olives? Yes, the thing that's the best part about this recipe is this is just a base. If you don't like olives, if you don't like parsley, leave them out. If you wanna put some cube cheese in there or some pepperoni, throw that in. Uh, really, it's just about a base. And if you like it a little tangier, you could probably throw in some Italian dressing. It's, it's just a basic, basic pasta salad. This is the way we always made it, but feel free to change it up however you want. 
Another question about olives, are they sliced black olives? Yes, I kept this recipe even simpler by buying the actual pre-sliced black olives, um, but you can buy regular olives and slice them up. I bet if you like it tangy, it would even taste good with green olives too. And another question about the tomatoes. What brand of tomatoes do you use? I'm not uh, that loyal to a particular brand, uh, but I do love San Marzano tomatoes whenever you can find them, whether you're using diced tomatoes or you're using you know, crushed tomatoes to make a sauce. San Marzano tomatoes are just a little bit sweeter, so you don't have to add the sugar to them, and they just, they're, they're straight from Italy, and they're just absolutely delicious. Slightly more expensive, but totally worth it, I promise. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. This episode is all about celebrating family recipes passed down from generation to generation. And Calvin absolutely loves his grandma's recipe for pasta salad, and I absolutely love my grandma's recipe for short ribs. So my grandmother lived in an apartment that my dad built above our garage in our house. So it was always special when we kind of walked up the stairs to my grandmother's apartment for dinner. Her home was always warm, and cozy and it always just smelled so good. Whether it was, you know, beef and barley soup or these short ribs. I just remember it was always like a meat and potatoes or a hearty dish. And we'd all just sit around at her brown dining room table and it just, it was just special. We were still home, but we were over Graham's house eating one of her recipes and they were always so delicious. For this recipe, you'll need short ribs, paprika, chili powder, poultry seasoning, onion, tomato paste, egg noodles, peas, and salt and pepper. Say hi, Mammy. Hi, Mammy. Hi, Cal. How, How are you today? I asked you for the recipe, and you said, you know, you just throw the meat in a dish, you throw this together, you put it on top, you, you cover it for a little, you cook it for a little. There was no written instructions with the recipe, so a lot depended on looking at it, seeing what it's doing, throw it in the oven a little bit longer. That kind of thing. Well, I wish you could be here with me to help make this and, and especially eat it with us. It'll be a tight squeeze, but we'll see if we can get them all here. Okay. There we go. They're all squeezed in there, right? Yeah. More okay. salt, pepper. Now we have to slice up an onion. Oh, what if it hurts my eye? 
I know. Can I close my eyes? Well, then it's hard to cut and close your eyes at the same time. Okay. I'm gonna make some slices here. Good job. You okay? Mm. We've got all kinds of spices here, okay? Are we gonna mix them up? Yeah, but first, I want you to scoop all of this tomato paste into here as well, okay? okay. You pour this water in there. I cannot do it. Because you're here to help me. Okay, so now we're gonna pour all of this all over our short ribs. Now we're gonna bake them. Now we're gonna bake them, you're right. So all we have to do, we're gonna cover this with foil. We're gonna bake it for like 45 minutes. 45 minutes, I have soccer, right? <laughs> That's right. Put it back in the oven without the foil so it finishes cooking. There's no This tastes exactly like my grandma's. Is hers yummy? Hers is so yummy. One of the questions I get asked all the time is what are the tools you use with Calvin in the kitchen? And knives are the big question because I'm cooking with a kid and here he is chopping some vegetables. So when I first started cooking with Calvin, I did all the chopping. I didn't want him anywhere near a knife. He did the stirring, he did the breaking of the eggs, he did all that. Then once he wanted to participate more, I found these knives. Um, they're plastic knives, you can find them anywhere online. So they're, they're sharp enough to cut, but they're not really sharp enough that Calvin would cut his finger. <laughs> so the best vegetables this works for are something like zucchini, something like cooked potatoes, uh, hard boiled egg would be good, soft fruits like berries or pears. And you know, it takes, takes a little little bit of strength but at least it you know is not going to hurt them and it kind of just gets them used to you know some knife skills i would also you know kind of do this for calvin i chop this up with my knife and then just give him a little bit to just sort of learn how to rock the knife learn how to keep his hands out of the way and just really basic knife skills with with soft fruits and vegetables that's what these knives are good for Eventually, it became a thing though where you know, you're making soup and you're chopping some harder stuff like carrots and onions. So I needed to upgrade a little bit and I found these great knives. This is an actual knife. I mean, it's, it's sharp and it will cut through your hard vegetables. But the thing I love about it is it also comes with this shield. So it teaches you the proper way to cut. So Calvin can put his hand here and he learns, you know, you stick your finger through this hole so he learns you know not to put his finger under here so his hand placement is good on the knife and then he learns to kind of rock but look at how this is like a real sharp knife for a kid but it's all safe the hand that's holding the knife knows how to hold it properly the hand that's holding the food knows how to hold it properly so that your fingers are kept out of the way the thing I love about this brand is that it also comes with a peeler Calvin loves apples and pears. Obviously he loves carrots, but he does not like the skin on anything. He'd peel a blueberry if he could. So the same kind of thing. You stick your finger in the hole and then it teaches you to just have your fingers out of the way. So my job is to make sure he holds, you know, the right end and isn't like, you know, doing it the wrong way. And this thing's role is to make sure Calvin holds this the right way. So you can see how sharp they are, they work. So once your kid masters the plastic knife, I think it's good to upgrade to the real deal. The next time you go to your parents or your grandparents' house, look through their recipe boxes. You may just find some delicious gems that you totally forgot about. But until then, I hope you'll try my family recipes 
and let me know what you think. For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. So first, what you're going to need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and shredded <laughs> mozzarella cheese. <laughs> My name is Peyton Janicki, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. I'm Peyton Janicki, I'm eight years old, and I'm in third grade. My earliest memory of cooking is when I was younger, I used to help my grandma make apple and pumpkin pies for Thanksgiving. I love cooking with my grandma because she's very nice and she's also a really good cook and at the end I get to eat it. <laughs> we need to add some chicken broth um, with a pot of oil in it. Um, and you need to let that sit before we add the couscous. My favorite thing about having my YouTube channel, Practically Peyton, it's basically just cooking and just like, it's not even, it's not even hard for me. It's, it's really fun. I love to cook for my mom, my dad, and my little brother, Michael. I also bake for my dog sometimes. For his first birthday, I helped bake him a cake. And it was basically just dog food, but shaped into like a bone shape. And it also came with some icing for dogs. He loved it so much. Some of my favorite hobbies are softball, swimming, dance, basketball, singing, and piano. When I grow up, there's three things that I might want to be. I want to be a teacher, a chef, and an art teacher because I love to do art. I think that cooking is basically kind of like art. I might put in the wrong ingredient and I still want to see how it turns out. It's basically like mixing paint colors. Today I'm so excited because I get to show you how to make Nanny's stuffed chicken breast and roasted broccoli. A couple of years ago, my Nanny's created this recipe because she was really good at making chicken cutlets and she knew one of my favorite foods was pepperoni. So she magically put the pepperoni in the chicken cutlets and it was amazing. Okay guys, let's get started. I'm so excited. Make sure you preheat the oven to 425 degrees. First thing is we are going to line this cookie sheet with foil and then we're gonna spray it with some non-stick baking spray. I love using foil because it makes cleanup super easy. The first ingredients that you're gonna need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and shredded mozzarella cheese. I like using shredded mozzarella cheese because you don't have to shred it. And it's just like so hard shredding it and you can get hurt shredding it. In a small bowl, I'm going to add breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and mozzarella cheese. This is my topping. The cheese and the olive oil are going to make the chicken brown, crispy, and delicious. So now you're gonna grab your thin chicken breast, salt, pepper, mozzarella cheese, pepperoni, and sour cream. The thinner the chicken breast, the better, because we're kind of making a pepperoni sandwich. And the bun is the chicken. Place half of the chicken breast on the prepared foil. Now we're gonna season it with salt and pepper. This is like sprinkling fairy dust. 
Now we're going to sprinkle it with a half a cup of shredded mozzarella cheese. You want to make sure you spread it evenly throughout the four chicken breasts. You don't want to skip out on the cheese. My brother loves cheese, so I think I'm going to give him a little bit extra. He'll thank you later. My favorite step of this whole thing, adding the pepperoni. So you want to add three pieces of pepperoni on each slice, each piece of chicken. What I love most about pepperoni is probably like it has like a little spice to it. It has like a little hotness. I love pepperoni so much. I even eat it for breakfast sometimes. And secretly I try to sneak it into all of my recipes. Now we're gonna place the other half of the chicken on top of all of these pieces of chicken. Now we're going to put a thin layer of sour cream onto the chicken. This has a really good flavor, it, and it also helps make the breadcrumbs stick to the chicken. It's kind of like frosting in a cake. Now we are going to put the breadcrumb mixture on top of the chicken. I like this breadcrumb mixture because it makes the chicken like nice and crispy, and it gives a different but good flavor. See, this is the magic of the sour cream because it's sticking perfectly. This is looking so good, I can't wait to eat it. Now it's time to put this in the oven. It looks great, but I can't do it since I'm a kid, so I need help from my dad. Dad! Now we're gonna bake that for 20 minutes, and in the meantime, I'm going to bake one of my most favorite side dishes, roasted broccoli. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. 
Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, and we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Fun fact, it is actually like when you get any vegetable and put salt, pepper, olive oil, and garlic powder like on top of it and bake it, it'll taste amazing. I actually won't eat broccoli any other way. I always bake it this way and I love it. Now the first thing we're gonna do is cut the broccoli into florets, but you can also just pull them apart and then you can have a parent cut it a little bit more after. Now that we're getting to the middle, I'm just gonna leave this for mom. Mom, can you come help me? Let's cut the broccoli. Make sure they're at a similar size so they roast evenly. Well, you're a fast cutter. Now, you're gonna add olive oil. Salt. Pepper. And garlic powder. Now you wanna mix this really well. And cooking can get messy, so Do it with your hands. It feels like, I don't know, like, have you ever like felt foam beads for like slime? It feels like that, but like wet and a little bit like more like crunchy. You wanna make sure they're in one row or layer because if it's not, it'll just steam instead of getting all like crispy and delicious. It's time to put this baby in the oven, but I need help. Dad. Now we have to wait 10 minutes. It's starting to smell so good, so that's a good sign. I'm getting super hungry too. Look at how amazing this looks. It looks so delicious. The chicken, it, it looks so crispy and good, and the broccoli, it look, the same. It, it looks very crispy and good. It just, I imagine it in my mouth. Tasting so good. All right, let's plate it. I'm gonna play another one because I have a special guest. I can't wait until she arrives. She's gonna love this meal. Oh my gosh, perfect timing, she's here. you were sniffing when you just came in. Oh, I can't wait to eat it. Thank you so, thank you so much. You're welcome. You did a great job. Mm. You made this exactly like I did. Okay, let's Actually, see how it tastes. Yours, I think, tastes even better. <laughs> it's so delicious. I love sharing meals with you. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> even if it's not this dish. <laughs> I love you so much. I love you too. I loved having you guys in the kitchen today. I hope you'll keep this recipe in mind 
and share it with someone special too. Bye! Under the gun, a weekend of staggering violence in America. 13 mass shootings in just 48 hours. Scenes